morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the January 27, 2021 Portola Valley Town Council meeting. Um, Sharon, can you please take roll call? Council Member Alves? Here. Council Member Warnikoff? Here. Council Member Richards? Here. Vice Mayor Hughes? Here. Mayor Derwin? Here. Oral communications, and I have a new preamble to read, which um, came via CARA. CARA and I have been working on um, oral communications and consent, and you will hear the preamble for consent next. Oral communications. The public may address the town council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the town council once under oral communications for a limit of three minutes. The town council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the town council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. If you would like to address the council on oral communications, please raise your hand now. Let me look. We have two hands raised so far. All right, I'm, let me, I'm having trouble getting to it. Let's look. All right, Rita. Hi, thank you. I, I, I just wanna give a, a thanks to Howard Young for the two no littering signs that are on Westridge. One's on the corner of Alpine Road and one is uh, Westridge and Cervantes. Um, hopefully that'll help the you know, the cigarette butts and all the other problems that we've been having uh, with litter. But um, I, I feel just by having those there, even if people don't read it, thank you for listening to the public. Um, my other question is um, on in the packet tonight on page, red page 51, it said that there was going to be a town manager report, but it's blank. Um, I don't know if that was uh, oversight, but I had gone to look at it, to read it, and there's, um, it just says that it's that it's not there. Um, I know you can't comment on it, and I guess I have to wait until by that time. But I just want to say that um, it's not there. I think Jeremy can make a brief comment. Is that yeah? Correct? I'm happy to through the chair, um, Rita. Both items uh, 13 and 14. So the items, the liaison committee, regional agency reports, and town manager reports are oral communication reports only, and uh, there are typically no written reports associated with those. And that's been the practice of the town since uh, we've started these. Okay, just to close the loop, if I could just say oral report, that would be, you know, my OCD, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rita. Bob Turcott. Hold on a second, Bob. There you go, you'll need to unmute at your end, Bob. How's this? Perfect. Okay. Um, my name is Bob Turcott. I've been a resident for 15 years, um, but only recently have gotten some exposure to um, the workings of the town. And um, this has um, generated a couple questions for me. Um, and also I have some feedback I'd like to give. Um, it's uh, prompted from a specific project, but I think the, um, my questions are uh, general ones about governance um, and similarly for the feedback. Um, and so the questions, um, Number one, is Portola Valley in compliance with the 2012 wildfire prevention planning bill, which as I understand it requires that wildfire hazards be planned for before further development is considered. And in particular was evacuation committee uh, capacity, evacuation capacity demonstrated to be adequate before accepting a proposal to drop uh, 39 household units, um, which would be in front of my family in an evacuation queue. And if we're not in, in compliance, how can I exert pressure on the town to make that happen? Um, second uh, question is um, regards the Stafford proposal. I was amazed to learn that the town actually solicited the proposal. And in fact, um, development in Portola Valley wasn't even considered by Stanford in its most recent 10 year plan. I've been trying to identify how this project is advantageous to Portola Valley. Is it the tax revenue? Um, I don't think so because taxes will only be paid on 27 of the 39 structures, not the land. So it's really, really a negligible amount. Is it the affordable housing? I hope not. I'd be mortified if Portola Valley viewed itself as doing a good job 
with affordable housing by offering a 450 square foot studio apartment to a teacher with a family of four. Is it fire risk mitigation? Um, this can be achieved without uh, high density housing development on, on our scenic corridor, which um, is in violation of our general plan. So my question is this, can you point me to the Portola Valley meetings in which soliciting this proposal was considered so I can review the minutes and understand what the perceived benefits are. And if not, can you give me some background on why this was done? And then finally, um, in terms of some feedback, I dialed into the ASCC meeting on Monday and I was very concerned by what I perceived to be a cloying obsequiousness to Stanford and his proposal. One commissioner was mistaken about what forms one of the boundaries of the wedge um, and went on to trivialize earthquake risk in response to express concern about building a high density project on a liquefaction zone. They flippantly suggested that um, it's simply a matter of using bigger pilings. Um, so as an engineer, it, you know, it doesn't inspire confidence that the proposal is being considered soberly and responsibly. Um, so thank you for your time. I appreciate responses to my questions. Okay, we cannot respond tonight, but we will try to get back to you. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, All right. Through the chair. Jeremy. Uh, Bob, uh, this is Jeremy, I'm the town manager. If you'd like to email me tomorrow, um, I'm happy to answer as many of the questions as I can. Um, some of the information that um, it sounds like you've been provided does sound inaccurate. So I'd be happy to clarify uh, those points. Jay Dennis at portolavalley.net. Thank or you. you. Get it on the website. All right. Then um, I will move on to the consent calendar. <sighs> yeah. So Cara and I discussed the Brown Act requirements for public comment on the consent agenda, as well as the town's earlier practices. And given the recent trends, we thought we would try returning to a more traditional Brown Act approach. So this is how we will handle it. I call for the consent agenda. I open the consent agenda and I say, under the consent calendar, the town council may take action to ap approve routine business items in one motion, unless a town council member or a town staff member requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. If you would like to comment on one or more items on the consent calendar before the council votes, please raise your hand to be recognized. Again, you have three minutes. Would anyone from the public wish to comment on an item on the consent calendar? I don't see any hands raised, Mayor. I don't either. All right, then I will bring it back to the council. Would anyone on the council wish to pull something from the consent agenda? Craig? Uh, item six. Okay. Jeff, John, Sarah, nope. Um, I was, yeah, I, I wasn't going, I'll pull item one. Minutes. minor issue. All right, we've got one and six being pulled. Is there a motion for two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine? Move approval. Move. Moved by Craig Hughes, seconded Second. by John Richards. Discussion? Um, roll call, please, Sharon. Councilmember Alves? Aye. Councilmember Warnikoff? Aye. Councilmember Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes? Aye. Mayor Derwin. Aye. Let's start with John number one. Very minor item, the very first page. The um, item number of people present, members, uh, council member John Elf. So I think you might want to fix the first name on, <laughs> on the list. I didn't even, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. That was it. Um, <laughs> John Elf, John Richards, and Wernikoff. So we should probably give yeah. Sarah a first name That's also, yeah. just, just while we're at it. Yeah. 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 All right. Did we note that? Any other corrections to the minutes? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve. Moved by Jeff, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Craig, oh, almost Sarah. Discussion? Roll call please, Sharon, for the vote. Council member Alves. Aye. Council member Warnikoff. 
Aye. Councilmember Richards. Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes. Aye. Mayor Derwin. Aye. Craig, number six. So item number six, um, I put together this colleagues memo for you um, and I uh, recommended uh, appointing a subcommittee, creating a subcommittee, um, but did not recommend specific members to be on there in the memo. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. clarify that if the council were acting, we're not just creating the subcommittee, but appointing Sarah and myself to the subcommittee if, if everybody feels that's appropriate. Does everybody feel that's appropriate? Does anyone feel that's inappropriate? <laughs> okay, then I think we're all- I would, I would form the subcommittee and appoint Sarah and myself to the subcommittee. Thank you, second. I will second. Thank you, Jeff. Discussion? Roll call, please, Sharon. Council member Alves. Aye. Council member Warnikoff. Aye. Council member Richards. Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes. Aye. Mayor Derwin. Aye. Mayor Derwin, if uh, if I could, through the chair, I'd like to promote um, the chairs of the committee to panelists at this point. It, it'll take just about a minute to do that, but I want to bring everybody on board. You're, please start. I just want to let you know I was doing that. Thank you. And if any chair I forget, please just... Raise your hand. People aren't allowed to do the chat anymore because of the bots, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Is everybody over yet? Nope. Slowly but surely. Every time I promote someone, the whole list moves, so it's hard to <laughs> control it. I think I got everyone. Oh, Chris, I forgot you. Hold on. And Mr. Ross, I'm going to leave you as an attendee per our previous conversation. Okay, I think I have everyone who's a chair here. Great. All righty. So item number, you know, I've got so many papers here. On the regular agenda, item number 10 is a council committee and commission workshop. I'm going to let Jeremy kick it off and then he can hand it back to me. Thank you. So uh, this is the second year that uh, the council's held its uh, workshop. This year, the council um, also invited the commissions, the uh, Planning Commission and the ASCC to uh, participate as well. This is an opportunity for the council and commission and committee chairs to hear each other's ideas on those projects that um, should be considered as part of the FY 21-22 budget, so next year's budget. Um, as part of that discussion, uh, share those ideas. If committees want to work on things together, they may hear it here first. And it's an opportunity for the council to share their thoughts and initial impressions on those items, direct staff to begin any work that needs to occur to accommodate that as part of the budget, um, also direct the committees to do any further work that they need. Tonight, um, per the direction to the committee chairs and commission chairs, it's a high level conversation. There was no intention to have specific dollar figures or um, every proposal uh, fleshed out but it's a chance for all of us to talk and um, hear your feedback at the staff level and start preparing the budget for you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, um, there is a simple outline of the workshop in the meeting packet and I'm going to follow that. So first item is introductions. Can we in some orderly fashion get everyone to introduce himself or herself? I will call on them uh, for my Brady Bunch row here. Um, and if you could just say who you are and uh, your, uh, your committee. So we'll start with uh, Judy. Hi, I'm um, Judy Murphy. I'm the chairman of the Conservation Committee. Dale. I'm Dale Fowl. I am 
chairman of the uh, Emergency Preparedness Committee. Thank you. John Myers. I am John Myers. I am chair of Parks and Rec. Thank you. Chris? Hi, I am Chris Ronis. I'm the former chair of the Emergency Preparedness Committee. Oh, I promoted you still think you were chair. Sorry about that. <laughs> Gary. Hi, Gary Hanning, uh, chair of Trails and Paths. Paige. I am chairman of the Cultural Arts Committee and uh, director of the Portola Valley Summer Concert Series. Brandy. Hi, I'm Brandy DeGarmo, co-chair of the Sustainability Committee along with uh, Marianne. Nancy. I'll introduce Here. Nancy for her. And Nancy Lund is the chairman of the Historic Resources Committee. Uh, Michael. Hi, this is Michael Tomars. I'm chair of the Wildfire Committee. And as I said earlier, we're also joined by uh, chair of the ASCC, Dave Ross, who's going to be uh, listening in tonight. And that's all. That's all of the, um, the chair uh, people. Um, we do have a number of committee members. Um, uh, uh, including uh, Chris Ronis, who's uh, with EPC. Um, I see Karen Batra, who's on the Wildfire Preparedness Committee. Catherine McGill, um, who's on uh, conservation. Uh, Lori Duvall, who's on the Emergency Preparedness Committee. Uh, Patty Dewis, who's on uh, Parks and Rec. Um, that looks like that's everyone I can identify. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Welcome. So the first question is why, why have a workshop like this? And um, we think this workshop is an opportunity for everybody to um, hear one another. This is the first time that we're bringing all of the various town bodies together in one virtual space. So we can hear from you and you can hear from each other about what everyone is up to. It's also a place for all of you to talk about your ideas, your priorities, and what is and isn't working. Consequently, that gives the council the opportunity to consider all your feedback as we start to develop our own priorities prior to establishing the draft budget. The workshop also gives you the rare opportunity to hear what others are working on and find connections where two or more committees might work on the same issue together. Council and staff, do, do you have any other thoughts on this? Did I get it right? As always, you got it right. Thank you. Mm, that is so insincere. Um, but do, do any of my colleagues have anything to say? Nope. All righty. Then we'll move on to a description of the council priority process. I would say for about the last seven years, the council has scheduled one or two priority setting sessions at council meetings prior to the development of the draft budget. We didn't always do this. We're doing it now. I think it's a fantastic idea. This gives staff input and guidance as they work on the budget. This year, our first priority setting session will be scheduled for February 27, and the follow-up session will be scheduled in April. And just for your general information, we see the draft budget first in June, at the first meeting in June. Since the town has limited finances, staff, and volunteer resources, the focus must be on the issues most important to the council, and the council really can't figure that out until we hear from you. It is important to note that Portola Valley has the smallest staff and budget of all the towns and cities in the county, and that is 20 towns and cities. Council, thoughts? Okay. The council liaison position. As you all know, every committee and commission has a council liaison who is encouraged to attend as many meetings as possible and is also encouraged to talk with the committee chair before and after each meeting. 15 years ago, the council liaison position was largely hands off. We attended meetings, we listened, we observed, we answered questions if asked, and we advised about rules of order and other such matters when necessary. Over time, I've seen the liaison role evolve, and now, in one case, 
a council liaison chairs a committee with a staff member. And in other cases, the committee and chair are quite reliant on the liaison for guidance. I'm of the mind that there's no one size fits all model. And it is more a matter of what a particular chair and liaison figure out what best works for them. Thoughts from the council about the role of the liaison. Okay, crickets. Council direction. Um, committees and commissions interact with the council about their ideas and projects in a number of ways. Some ideas are homegrown from the work of, of the committee. Some come to the committee through residents. Others are based on council direction, which often finds its roots in the community. This is to the chairs who are here tonight. During your presentations, can you please share your thoughts on this process? Have there been times when the council has reached out to you to do a specific task that was not high on your priority list? We would like to hear your thoughts on whether the process is working. Colleagues, do you think the process is working? Colleagues would rather wait and hear how you feel. Committee recommendations. Volunteers are the backbone of our community. No other town or city in the county has as many committees doing real work for the town, nor this level of council involvement in the committees. Our volunteers are one reason we have been able to keep our staff small, although I personally think they're a little stretched right now, but that's a different conversation. Um, committees spend a lot of time working on projects or programs before they finally come to a record recommendation to bring to the council. And more times than not, we adopt the recommendations. But sometimes a committee's ideas are not adopted for one reason or another. And when that happens, it does not diminish our gratitude to you for the work. This is another reason to try to align your work with our council priorities and do workshops like this so we can all sit at the same table early on and try to move in the same direction. Any thoughts? All right, sharing of 21-22 priorities. I believe there was a typo there. We are talking about the 2021-2022 budget and priorities. Now is the time I'd like to ask each chair to share your high level priorities, your ideas, your concerns, your reactions or responses to any of my re remarks this evening. As a reminder, please try to keep your remarks to 10 or 15 minutes. Jeremy, would you like to call on the committees? Or do you want me to? I'd be happy to. I'll go in the same order as uh, I did earlier. So uh, we'll start with uh, Judy, and then after Judy will be Dale. And Dale, I have your slide. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, the Conservation Committee was the first committee created when the town was created. Uh, it's a very long-standing, hardworking committee. There are people who've been on this committee for 40 years. Um, and there's an enormous depth of knowledge uh, on the committee, both historical knowledge about what the town has been through and uh, also um, biologists, scientists, horticultural knowledge. Um, so we're lucky to have that, that level of expertise with us. Our primary goal outset from the very beginning has been to maintain the natural resources and protect the habitat in town. Um, 50 years ago, that probably meant sort of throwing ourselves in front of every tree that was wanted to be taken out. And now um, it shifted a little bit because we understand that our role now has to be a bit different, acknowledging the realities between Portola Valley in 1964 and Portola Valley in 2021. So we still see protecting habitat and our rural environment as our primary uh, task that that's why we exist and um, that we bear that responsibility more than anyone else in town so that that we take positions on things uh, knowing that we may be the only people in town who are speaking on that side of an issue um, but we're very cognizant of the fact that it, there's a real world out there and the Bay Area is very different and the pressures on us are very different. So we uh, are trying hard to balance what we want to do, what our individual feelings are about it with uh, it, 
I think we now see it as optimizing the natural resources and optimizing the degree to which we can protect things given the development that's going to have to happen. Um, so our, um, our primary tasks have have always been um, being advisory to ASCC on site, new site projects. We look at the landscaping, we look at the site, that sort of thing. We write a report advisory to ASCC and um, they incorporate that in their decision-making. Um, in the last few years, we've taken on the major task that was assigned to us by the council of evaluating all the town owned properties and looking at what's up with them. And we went through a very extensive process. I'm not gonna to begin to go back through that. What that's devolved into is that we now um, carry responsibility for being uh, sort of maintenance advisors <laughs> to public works about restoration and optimizing maintenance of the most important properties in town, Spring Down, Frog Pond, Triangle Park, the playing fields, town center. And that takes up a fair amount of time. Um, and we have a very close working relationship with Howard as a result, he and I speak frequently and I have great admiration, admiration for how many uh, balls he's able to keep in the air at one time. Um, so this year, in, I would say the primary thing is we would like, Conservation Committee would like to urge the council to continue to prioritize the natural environment that as you make your, your short list of what your priorities are just because of what Portola Valley is and the history of why it even exists, that that has to remain one of your fundamental priorities, protecting our natural environment. And um, in terms of budgetary things where we're gonna, where we're gonna go, the budget we ask for ourselves is usually very minor and it has to do with things like cookies for the broom pool, you know. So the main thing I wanted to say to you um, in terms of budget has to do with once again, as I've done in the last several years, asking you to consider um, significant amounts to public works to be able to maintain our most important properties in the way they deserve to be maintained. We've made enormous progress over the last couple of years with that. You've devoted some significant resources to that. Uh, in the last couple of years, and I and I want us to continue to do that. To do that, um, there are some specific things that are on here that we have asked for in previous years that didn't get approved. So we're going to put those back on the table. Uh, for Frog Pond, we think it would be good to have a, a consultation with a pond biologist, even though there are, are biologists and scientists on several of the committees that are involved, have been involved, open space and conservation. Um, in our, in our conversations with the town and different people's ideas, I think it might be good to have an authoritative outside source that looks at the ups and downs of the frogs and the harding grass, et cetera, so that all of our projects are in alignment with, with those ideas. Howard has estimated that'd be about a $5,000 thing. Um, we'd like to begin removal of the harding grass at Frog Pond. We, that's too expensive to do all at once, but we think if we chipped away at it, we can make progress. Um, something new there has been, um, there's a fence along Frog Pond that separates the road remnant from, from what currently exists as Frog Pond open space that needs some restoration. There's been a lot of spillover with the increased use on the trails in COVID there's been spillover into the open space area itself that um, probably we could decrease if we repaired that fence. That, that, I don't have a cost for that, but it shouldn't be a very expensive process. Um, shifting to town center, the um, creek maintenance needs to be picked back up. That's been traditionally done with grassroots ecology. I think it wasn't done last year and it can't be delayed for many years in a row. You may not need to do it every year, but it's, um, it's important that that happens so it doesn't uh, disappear among the willows. <laughs> the child, children get lost in there and never seen again. Um, we'd like to see further protection of that largest heritage oak by discouraging foot traffic. There's a few that that tree was protected a bit in terms of arboreal work, but um, it'd be nice to have a little short uh, rustic fence section 
to block the informal path that's there because that informal path, although it's not used much, continues to compact the dirt around that important tree. And there's a bench in that area that attracts people to walk across there and sit. And that bench should be moved away from that area, um, probably near the trail and fronting the playing fields so it would get better, better use. Uh, and at spring down, we'd like to continue to our attempts to control the weeds and encourage the wildflowers. We'd like um, uh, at least four times a uh, timed, well-timed, as well-timed as we can manage uh, mechanical mowings and six days of hand weeding at spring down. Uh, and that's, that's primarily it. We are lucky to, to be working really closely. We, we've uh, traditionally worked closely with trails and open space so that any project that we take on that we think might involve them, we, we're in the habit of asking them. We send a representative to those meetings and um, we look forward to that kind of cooperation continuing. I think it's important and it's, it's helped us do better work. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Does anyone else from uh, conservation wish to speak? Let me look here. Catherine, if you want to say anything, feel free to raise your hand and I can uh, unmute you. Not to put you on the spot. Okay, she, yes, you're putting her on the spot. <laughs> That's not nice, Jeremy. I know, I'm sorry. Um, okay, sorry. does the council have any comments or questions for Judy? I think you're doing a great job. I will advocate for funding the maintenance of those properties. I really think we need to put money there. Is, no one else has anything else to add. You're doing a great job, Judy. Your, your committee is central to Portola Valley. And what Portola I'll speak up now. It's OK. I'll just second uh, Judy's request and, and uh, mention that I think that the committee has been doing a fabulous job and is uh, very careful to analyze all these um, these processes that need to be done to, to maintain our, our open spaces. Uh, it's not, none of it is uh, just off the cuff. It's all really, really well studied. So um, I think we'll um, repeat our our support from the last couple of years and hopefully be able to increase it a bit. Thank you. All righty. So Jeremy, can we move on to the next committee? Yeah, next is uh, Dale Fowl from the EPC and after that will be John Myers from uh, Parks and Rec. And Dale, do you want me to bring up your slide right now? Yeah, that would be great, Jeremy, thank you. <clears throat> Give me just a moment. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Um, most of you are aware of, of what the EPC committee does. Um, we're heavily involved in a number of activities. It seems that, like our charter continues to change. Uh, historically, we've been more focused on uh, wildfire and, and community, I mean, uh, earthquake and communications. Now we're shifting a lot of our, our thoughts toward how can we support the town and prepare this during wildfire. Um, we support a lot of communication activities for the town, uh, the AM radio, the uh, shortwave radio. We support the uh, uh, liaison with the new WPV CERT and WPV Ready organizations, and we liaise with uh, clearly with wild, uh, Woodside Fire. So that's been very positive. John Richards is our liaison. Just a comment about that. Um, John's been with the committee, uh, boy, since I've been on it, so it's a number of years. We feel very good about John's um, participation in the committee uh, compared to other people. I mean, John offers us guidance. We turn to him, particularly on issues where uh, we need guidance from the council in a particular direction. But in general, the committee is, is pretty self-sufficient and we know where we're going. Uh, I think over the coming year, uh, one of the things that we're going to focus on is the is how our committee liaises with Woodside and their new burgeoning EOC and EPC uh, with 
continuing with Woodside Fire and with the resurgent WPV Ready and WPV Cert and how we all integrate, work together and avoid duplication of efforts. So that's going to be a fairly significant uh, job moving forward. As far as budgetary items, uh, Jeremy, if you'd move to the next slide, here's a few things that uh, came up. We discussed this in committee earlier this year. Uh, we are in the far along in the planning steps to relocate the, ta relocate the town AM radio to a site uh, up on Peak Lane at the Cal Water site. Uh, Cal Water has been very good to work with. They're, they seem to be very supportive. Um, if you don't know, the, the AM radio was relocated from the town center to uh, a private property, Ray Rothrock's property up on Granada. We get much better coverage of the town and the environs in that location rather than down in the hole where the town center is. And by moving it to Peak Lane, we get uh, essentially the same coverage. Uh, Jeremy initiated the request to move the AM radio because it's on a, a Cal Water site instead of a private property. This is gonna be a fairly expensive project. We estimate about $25,000. It could be a little bit higher than that. Uh, we've been working with uh, not only Cal Water, but uh, Howard in, uh, at the town to, to make this happen. And we should be getting this started, actual digging uh, here a little bit later this year. Next item is medical supplies. Uh, as I'm sure some of you are aware, we do have some medical supplies at town center. They're in a cabinet in the Buckeye room. Uh, some of those need to be upgraded and replaced. Uh, we are looking for some grants. There's a possibility for some grants there, but right now as a placeholder, it's probably about three to $4,000 uh, for those medical supplies. Um, as you are also aware, we do an awful lot of outreach and communications. A lot of that is led by Lori Duvall with uh, Carrie Chin at the town. It's been very successful. Most of you are aware that we're number one in the county with uh, signups for SMC Alert. That's been specifically because of the outreach and communications from not only the town, but uh, the EPC and, and our events that we've held for many years. And it's been very, very good. Uh, we want to continue to push that uh, this year. We're uh, estimating about two to $3,000. This is more flyers. We may do a new magnet mailing for the AM radio and so on, uh, but that's kind of a placeholder there. On to uh, the item where I talked about the integration coordination efforts with CERT and, uh, and the EOC. Um, at the moment, we're planning to actually have a WPV CERT location uh, in case of emergency in the Buckeye room. And to support that, that we may need to uh, in, invest in some equipment, some radios, uh, maybe a computer. That's about three to $4,000 to replicate what we need to do to put uh, support that effort. And uh, this is a very positive thing, uh, as you are aware, um, WPV certain would actually be our eyes and ears for the town EOC on the ground to tell us what's going on in an emergency. And uh, there's a complete radio uh, plan uh, for the divisions and, and for the members of the uh, WPV cert. And this, this would be sort of the core, the center of that. And it's very close to the EOC. So there'd be good communication between those two. And the last item I have is that the uh, CERT has identified funds for a grant to buy a trailer, uh, which will be loaded with emergency supply, supplies for WPV CERT. And we'll need to find a location somewhere here in Portola Valley, preferably on near the town center site to store that trailer. So I'm just going to put that up there for discussion by the town council. So that's a very quick synopsis, but this, uh, these are our plans for this year. Great, that's a lot of plans. Uh, is there anybody else from your committee who would like to speak? Let me look. Jeremy, do you see any hands? I do not. Okay. Council, do you have any questions or comments? John? Oh, comment. I, as you can see, and I've got another really great committee to work with. And um, 
as Dale said, they're very um, self, they're a bunch of self-starters. They're really involved. And I don't think we've ever, or maybe only once or twice since I've been on this as the liaison, have we not have had a quorum, which is really amazing. Um, not only that, we also always have visitors from Woodside and the, the fire chief shows up almost every time. Um, it's, it's a really a very active and really consequential group. So I'm really pleased. And um, I, the list of items that Dale laid out, um, again, we've been talking about them for quite a while and they're, I think they're all really make a lot of sense. So um, all my support for sure. I agree. Anybody else on the council? Nope. Well, Dale, again, another stellar committee doing incredible work that is pretty much life and death work. So we really appreciate it. Keep doing it. Who is the next committee we will hear from? This is John Myers. And after that will be uh, Brandy for uh, sustainability. Hello, everyone. Good to see you again, sort of. Uh, so, um, so in Parks and Rec, our mission is to promote and support recreational activities in the town to basically get people outside and active. Um, so there's a number of things we do associated with that. One is um, we work with or um, uh, really just uh, talk to the, the leagues, the youth leagues, the youth soccer, little league, baseball, the adult leagues, and just uh, try to support them, help them, get them to work together uh, so that we, you know, to work out things in terms of whether it's their scheduling, field use, prioritization. Um, I, the big issue, of course, with all of this this year uh, is, is the COVID situation and, you know, the challenges associated with that. So, you know, for instance, we had discussions today about what are the plans for the spring you know, we've, it's, when this all started last spring, you know, we, uh, things shut down. We thought it was going to be the end of the month and then to the end of the season and then the end of the summer. And, you know, now we're into a year. Um, so as to, you know, what they can and cannot do, uh, we, you know, we talked that through with them. Um, clearly it's, it all comes down to abiding by the state and county um, guidelines, but still as to, you know, what all that means, interpretations, what the, can and should be doing, getting the right waivers, et cetera. You know, there's a fair amount there. So um, again, I'll say coordinating with, with the um, youth and adult sports leagues is one of the things that we do. Another is we have a, a couple of events that we would plan under normal times. Again, uh, we'll see kind of when this happens again, but uh, there was the town picnic, uh, parks, uh, there's uh, Zots the Tots. So, um, you know, that usually, or we had moved that to September timeframe. Um, and while that's still a little ways away, you know, when, when is the next time we're gonna get hundreds of people together uh, at the town center um, is not clear. And, um, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes into that. And so when, you know, when do you start that planning or do you do that planning, et cetera. So there's a lot of issues there to, to work through. Um, then there are um, other, I'll say, um, you know, things that come up. Uh, first of all, there's not only the, the fields, but there's the courts. And so, um, you know, I, I'll be talking later, I hope, uh, around the, the pickleball. Um, you know, we, we did fortunately get it set up such that tennis people could play. Um, there's a lot of pickleball players too. We work on things like, again, they want to, and I'll be talking about this, uh, paint more pickleball courts on, on the second tennis court. Uh, it's those kind of issues that we uh, kind of, you know, work through and, and ultimately try to, uh, you know, advise, let's say, the town council in terms of what, uh, what, what our recommendation is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, if I can interrupt just a second through the chair. Uh, John, because the consent item, it was a consent item for the pickleball court. So the second tennis court, the council's already approved it. So you got it. Mystic. All right. That'll let me go have a beer a little bit earlier. That's great news. Uh, and so, you can go outside. Right. You know, at a restaurant outside. We're in the purple tier. Oh, okay. So you can now right. eat. Like, there you go. Exactly. Right. Sorry. <laughs> now it took me a moment. 
We need to get to the orange tier, by the way, so that we can play soccer again. Uh, so um, anyway, so uh, so there's other things that come up like that. And so actually to kind of get to the, 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 the budgetary elements of other way. So it, is, it costs about $18,000 between the town picnic and Zots to Tots. So we'll have to figure out again what we do with that. Actually, another thought I had was since we didn't spend that money last year and we'll see what happens this year, what we're thinking we'll do is throw a really, really big party like a year from now. Anyway, we'll see, uh, we'll let you know. The, uh, um, so, and then there are some other things that are under, you know, just long-term under discussion for, um, that we talk about in, in, in Parks and Rec. There's always for the last 20 years, we've talked about, is there a, uh, uh, a way we could have a dog park as an example? You know, we, uh, the issue with that as with many of the things we look at is usually around um, availability of space for that. So, but we'll be talking through that and reviewing that. A couple other ideas that come up regularly is things like doing a fitness trail where, you know, you, um, they actually have something like that near the Sequoias, but you know, places where people can exercise uh, along the, uh, the trails. Um, there's like always ideas like a pump track and I can explain what that is, but it has to do with basically how, um, you know, these BMX bikes can ride around in kind of a fun way that is not, um, you know, create a lot of, um, uh, construction required for it. But anyway, there's a bunch of ideas that people have that we evaluate and ultimately if we can get it done, the more that we can do to, Again, get people out and active, um, you know, the better. Uh, historically, we've done other things, you know, we'll see what comes along, like back when Ford Field was being renovated, uh, you know, we obviously were, took a, a lead on that in terms of uh, helping, ensuring that the funding was there, fundraising, um, you know, the plans for that, et cetera. And so there's a few kind of things that come along once in a long while. And the, uh, for this year, it's obviously going to, it starts with trying to facilitate the leagues and the, um, you know, kind of see what we can and cannot do and try to do whatever we can within the guidelines um, and working on a couple of the, uh, by the way, another thing that is going to potentially require funding is the, the skateboard ramp. Um, it's, uh, that's on the all sports court and it needs to be replaced. It's falling apart. So um, we're going to talk about kind of what we do there, when we do it, et cetera. It's closed right now, so it's not, obviously not a major factor. It costs about $2,500 for uh, one exactly like the one that's there. So we'll be talking through, you know, what, what we recommend in terms of, you know, uh, if we replace it, if so, when, when do we do it, and, and what do we replace it with? So there'll be, again... Um, uh, discussions around that and ultimately a recommendation. So that's Parks and Rec. Any uh, questions or comments? Well, or does anybody else on your committee who's here tonight wish to speak? Jeremy, does anyone wish to speak? Do you see a hand? No hands at this time. All right. Council members, do you have comments or questions? Jeff? Yeah, um, I'm I'm taking over as liaison to the Parks and Rec Committee. This was Anne's committee for years, um, so much so that I, I don't think I didn't. I think I missed your meeting earlier this month because I I'm so used to her taking the meetings that it didn't even occur to me. So um, I will be there on Monday, which I believe is your next meeting. Yes, it is. Uh, looking forward looking forward to it. Um, and you know, you guys have always uh, have done led a, led a lot of great projects, um, especially around the town center, but also the fields and. Um, just look forward to seeing more of that. Hopefully, yes, we can all actually be together in person one day again. So, thank you. And as a fellow softball player, I hope we uh, see each other out in the softball field too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I want to acknowledge John's work during um, COVID. I know this has been insanely challenging for your committee, but you have been really helpful in trying to work things out with some very frustrated pent up I was going to say villagers, I'll say residents. Um, and it was a hard situation. You really did a great job in finding a compromise. Thank you. Thank Hoping you. that we won't yeah. have to be yeah. doing the compromises in the future and everything will be open. 
Anything else, people? I just want to say hi, John. I'm going to be um, Jeff's backup on your committee. And so I just look forward to learning more and getting to know all you guys and echoing Marianne. I know it hasn't, I've got three kids and know a lot of tennis players. So I know it's been a tough, tough couple months uh, managing through all this. So thanks for all your, your hard work and patience. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Good, good to meet you. And we're looking forward to working with you. Likewise. Great. Thank you, Park and Rec. Jeremy, who's up next? Next is uh, Brandy for sustainability. And then after that will be Paige Bishop for the Cultural Arts Committee. Okay. Hello, um, before I get going with sustainability, I just uh, wanted to reiterate what we were saying about Parks and Rec. One of my other hats is overseeing facilities rentals. And I just wanted to personally thank John for all of his assistance in navigating the use of the facilities this year. It has been very challenging. Parks and Rec usually is a well-oiled machine, um, but not this year. And John's uh, John was instrumental in getting tennis and pickleball going again. So thanks, John, so much for your help and your continued help as we um, reopen the fields soon. So um, as I mentioned before, Mary Ann and I are co-chairs for the Sustainability Committee. And they have um, four priorities, which are organized around the council priorities, but also around the members' interests to capitalize on that energy. Um, their first priority is researching and developing potential programs related to opportunities with energy efficiency, EV charging, battery backup, and emergency preparedness. Second goal is a climate change reading discussion group and online list, and that list can be found on the town website and then continued work on smart water meter implementation and potentially expanding um, alternatives and then recruiting new members for the committee um, as we've had some um, members recently step down. The, the history of this committee is that it um, was the water conservation committee when we were in the last drought and several of those members um, as it transformed to other efforts, they've dropped off and so um, the committee is, is will likely be transitioning a little bit as they will start recruiting for new members and then we're in, we've discussed moving it to a committee um, member led chair rather than a staff and council led chair so that will naturally change the um, what the goals are of the committee, but next year, um, they have asked for um, some funds to go towards a potential checkout of a portable solar panel and potentially a lottery to support that um, the work that they've done around EV charging and battery backup. Uh, two of our committee members, Stefan uh, Unash and Walter Hayes, have developed in a list of simple, inexpensive um, solar and battery backup options to a full microgrid, including the environmental impacts of each of those. And one of their um, next tasks is going to be reaching out to the Emergency Preparedness Committee. This, this effort has the dual benefit of both being energy efficient, but also serving um, for safety and emergency preparedness. So that's going to be one of their asks. We think they'll likely um, ask for around $2,000 for that. And then we are still um, in the midst of the uh, Cal Water rate case with the California Public Utilities Commission. We're hoping that will be resolved soon. And we're hoping, we believe that it will lead to the town getting smart water meters. But if it doesn't, the committee would like to pursue, would like some funds to pursue, pursue alternatives. There's an um, one alternative called, well, I won't mention it, but it's around $200. So we could potentially do a pilot program for that. Um, and then depending on what happens um, with COVID, they will likely um, try and host, co-host the garden tour with the conservation committee. Um, that was very successful a few years ago and um, residents really enjoyed that. So depending what happens um, there. And then um, also depending on the earth bear um, in the following, I guess that would be 2022, we'll see what happens there. So those, those are their um, major priorities and goals. Um, as far as a uh, process, the committee has asked to um, see the draft climate action plan and the measures before it goes to the council. Um, and then there have been, a, it's been interesting because there've been a couple things that um, 
the council has asked the committee to look at that it wasn't really committee driven. And so I think it's just interesting to see how um, the work flows if it's council driven or committee driven. But as I mentioned, you know, all of that will change if they go to um, a committee member chair. So that is my report. I just want to add as the co-chair that this committee's roots were in the climate change task force that was established in 2006 that Steve Tobin and I co-chaired. So we have had, and wasn't that when we hired you, Brandy? Were you hired in 2006? I was hired, it, it, I was hired in 2000, September 15th, 2008, one week after the town center was um, Inhabited. But I think the recommendation to hire a sustainability coordinator came from this task force. Yes, correct. Um, and I do have to agree that when we actually asked the committee to do something, and that was to, I believe it was the leaf blower task, they did it, but they did not enjoy it. And they much more enjoy doing the things that they create. Does anybody have a question for Brandy? All right, well, thanks Brandy. And as she mentioned, we are recruiting for this committee. Next is cultural arts and Paige. And uh, Gary, you'll be after Paige. Hi Paige. Paige, you're muted. Oh, muted. I am, is this better? Yep. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so first, uh, full disclosure, I'm at a celebratory dinner, um, which relates to something that I'll share with you next, um, is that I, um, after all these 15 years, um, am moving. Um, so I had a great discussion with Jeremy today and um, disclosed that it looks like um, I'll need to resign um, from chairing the Cultural Arts Committee as well as being director of the Patrol of Arts um, from the summer concert series. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. <laughs> I think this is probably the hardest part of, of moving because I'm so connected uh, with, with the town through music and all the friendships and everything that it takes to kind of keep that thread going. So um, I, I tend to be a fairly easygoing person, but in my heart, it's, um, it's way in super heavy and it's not easy. The good news, however, is that on our committee existing is um, John Badger, who is um, entrenched in our community and well-regarded and um, is, has accepted um, the position if if the town is willing to accept his um, position here, uh, John Badger would be willing to take on uh, running the summer concert series as well as um, chairing the cultural arts committee. Um, and the great focus for the committee at this point has been on the concert series. Um, so we have some things to iron out there, but. He, uh, that's, that would be his, his personal focus, his passion is around music and he would do an outstanding job. I can think of nearly no one else who could um, be able to harness the same amount of people in the community and, and rally, you know, everybody's enthusiasm around it and keep it all going and get, you know, great artists and have it representative of the community and beyond. So that's kind of the short, uh, of the big news on my side and and the reason I was celebrating over here is because I've got you know a couple months left locally um and unless for something you know anything could change but it feels like right now um that that's the movement and I wanted to put it out there sooner than later so our committee uh with that is because of COVID probably only looking at the outside possibility of having a community event by October. Um, that would be best case. Um, 
I'm certainly willing to, you know, entertain and together with John, we'll sort of co-chair this as we go forward. I'm certainly not leaving him without um, a tremendous amount of support, even all the way through October and beyond, because um, most of our discussions will be done via Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I'm there to help him out. But we think that October might be a possibility for some kind of COVID safe um, celebratory event. I love um, the idea that I think of renewal that Marianne, you had brought up that as a title um, that we should at some point celebrate the renewal of our, of our community. And I love sort of building on that theme. Um, so in, in, in regarding budget in our committee, you know, we'll stay within the guidelines of where we've already been acting with our budget. There won't be any wild changes. I don't think there's an ask for additional amount of money. We'd only have one concert. I can imagine things like COVID safe signs that would be needed that might be, you know, uh, um, but I think it'll all fall comfortably within the budget that we already have. So I don't, I don't foresee any surprises from a budgetary standpoint. Um, and John and I uh, will work easily going forward. He has a, a co-chair um, candidate that he would introduce and we'd have him go through the natural progressions of getting elected and, or not elected, but you know, uh, approved. And then I think we'd move forward comfortably. Jeremy, is there anything that I'm forgetting from our conversation earlier? No, I think you covered everything. Okay, well, so you can imagine for me, it's impossible. I, I can't imagine not being connected to the concert series. So I'll probably come back for October. I'll probably sing, <laughs> but, um, but I certainly would want to say um, good wishes to everybody in the community. And it is an incredible honor to have worked um, for the for the community mm -hmm. and on behalf of music and bringing everybody together. It's the fondest thing that I have in my heart for sure in Portola Valley. Yeah, I think I've been looking at John Richards and at one point he looked really angry and then at one point he looked really sad. <laughs> And now he's waving his hand in a way. I'm not angry. <laughs> I believe you, John. I believe I'm you. Just, I but just want John, to make sure like that. To speak? Yeah, let me speak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure that, that Paige, that you get all the credit you deserve for all the years you've managed to bring the music into the town and, and support our, our huge priority of, of maintaining and building community. So yeah. you know, that's been invaluable. And I uh, really hate to see you leave, but uh, I know John will be able to t do it. And, and of course, and you, I mean, he's already a member of the committee. So yes, he is. Uh, so you guys, next time you meet, you can appoint him as the chair if that's what he wants to do. And correct, we'll, we'll go for it. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, and yes, he was on the call today with Jeremy. We wanted to have that call in person. And I had written Jeremy in, you know, just a week ago or so. So we're, we're in cahoots on that. Great. Who, who is on the committee right now, Paige? There, well, it's dwindling because a couple, a couple have. Um, uh, so Mimi has uh, moved to Menlo Park and is no longer. Um, she hasn't officially resigned, I don't believe, and I probably don't. I don't have the list in front of me right now, Marianne. Um, but um, we're down to about three, and even Sue Shapu has been ill, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, we might have to work on a bit of a skeleton crew and as such, I would certainly remain involved on, on a monthly basis. Um, we were talking with Jeremy a little bit about, you know, how many does it take to, to keep the, to keep it officially endorsed by the town and maybe that needs more discussion, but we, I would say at a minimum, and especially if I say, folks, we need to all participate for the next couple times in, ahead of October, we need to have four people, then I'm certain that we can keep that going and I'll be one of those four. And, I, and my time frame is, is, um, is roughly April. And by the way, there's a very small number of people, you guys among them, anybody else who's listening in now, <laughs> 
who who knows about this. So um, you know, you kind of keep new you kind of keep news close until things unfold. Right. But well, we are congratulate you. We're excited for you at the same time that I know we're all a little broken hearted. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I feel the same way. I'm actually super excited and I can't hardly believe I wouldn't be associated with this. So it's um, super heavy hearted. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments? If I could just make a quick comment. One of the things that uh, Paige and John and I talked about uh, today was, um, and we probably have all forgotten about it, I certainly had, um, was that last, in October 19, uh, 2019, the council um, made some organizational changes to the committee handbook and actually created a new committee, the, the Community Engagement Committee. Um, it makes some sense that we didn't do any recruitment for it because we've just spent the last year uh, not doing uh, the kind of community engagement we expected that committee to do. So uh, I shared with uh, John Badger and also want to offer this to the other, the other committees and particularly Parks and Rec if there's some event, uh, but others that the idea behind that committee is to have a group of people who are um, um, interested in helping plan events and be involved in that kind of um, uh, planning effort. Um, so, um, you know, certainly I, I think uh, as we move forward, um, we probably want to start thinking about what that committee would want to look like and start recruiting for it so we can hit the ground running for any events that come up uh, later this year as part of our renewal efforts. Okay. Yeah, I, I love that idea, uh, by the way. Um, and I, I think it gives people an opportunity to just jump in and support the events and passions that they, you know, that they're that they're most aligned with. Um, and I think that the concert series in particular would might be a great place to have people do that to say, hey, I, you know, I love it. and I'd love to be able to help out in this way. And we could divvy out some of the things that I've traditionally done um, kind of as a as a sole um, supporter but uh but john john's aware of that and, and he's got a, a lovely crew of people that he works with um friends who would who will be uh by his side so i don't think that we will lean any heavily more heavily on the on the town um council you know than we have in the past and certainly brandy i can't thank you enough for all of your help always and and John for coming to our meetings and, you know, Jeff for your support and Jeremy for your infinite support. Um, heavy heart. Thank you, Paige. Yeah, you're welcome. I really wish you well, but you're not going right away. You said April. No, okay. probably about April, but uh, uh, very much involved on online and I'll come back for the concert. Are you kidding? I'll drive back if I have to. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Paige. Well, I just, I just want to say, I don't think any of us will, will forget how you made that concert series come to life and um, what, what a fixture it became for our summers here. Um, and thank you for that. And, and you really did make that happen. And um, as your, as your former neighbor, I will, I will miss you. I will <laughs> yeah, you. miss you already yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, to be continued on that point, we can still uh, we can still chat on the sides. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, who is next? Next is Gary Hanning uh, from Trails, and then after that will be Nancy Lund from Historic Resources. All right, Gary Hanning, Trails. Thank you. And uh, boy, it'll be hard to follow that. Um, Paige knows how how fond I am of the summer concerts, and this is the first I've heard. So uh, we're going to miss you, Paige. Really. Um, and we owe you mountains of gratitude. Uh, you know, the summer concerts bring us together as a town. Uh, the families love them, the kids love them, my kids love them. And it's really something we've looked forward to, you know, of course not this year, but last year, literally we had them on the counter, on the calendar, we were counting the days down. <laughs> they were that much fun. So we'll look forward to seeing you though, Paige. I'm sure you'll be back and but again, thank you for all you've done, really. Um, okay, trails. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I want to start by thanking... Oh, you're going to get a lot of things. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, 
I just want to start by thanking the town council, uh, all of the committees and commissions and all the residents in town for their support of the trails uh, during this pandemic. Uh, you know, the trails have never served us as well as they are serving us today. They, I believe they're saving lives. I, I truly do believe that. You know, we, the, not only are they giving us an avenue to get out and exercise, but it allows us in a, in a safe, uh, distanced way outdoors to see our neighbors and our friends. And, and that, uh, that social contact is so important. And I think we've only just begun to measure uh, the impact of, of not having that, uh, particularly certain um, groups of, of, of residents. So we couldn't be happier that the trails are open. They are open. We encourage residents to get out on the trails, to use them. I'm also so very proud of uh, the trails committee, town staff, and everyone who made it possible to close the Sequoia Trail two days a week so that the Sequoia residents could safely get out and exercise on a trail close to home. This was uh, the highest of highest risk groups and it was so important for them uh, to get out and they have done nothing but shared their gratitude uh, back to us for having that trail two days a week. So thanks to everybody who was involved in getting that done. Uh, trails, you know, our meetings are pretty straightforward. Every month we get a trail maintenance update from Public Works. We work very closely with Howard on identifying new trail maintenance issues, on dealing with seasonal trail maintenance issues, on dealing with issues that pop up that we never foresaw. We get all of the above. Um, but every, uh, every month Howard prepares a report that we get and we thank Howard for that because it does give a snapshot of where the trails are. We know the trails are getting used a lot more than they ever have been. And so this is something the trails committee has had to adjust to. We didn't foresee this coming. And so it will have an impact, I think, down the road with budget. And we can talk about that more in just a little bit. Um, the trails committee has been prioritizing, this has been an ongoing effort for us, we've been prioritizing a capital intensive uh, project list. And these are, these are projects that lie outside of the normal uh, maintenance cycles. So for example, we'll use the Sequoia Trail. Um, that's an all season trail. It has base rock on it. So the trail stays open to all, uh, to hikers and equestrians all throughout the year. Well, the, the base rock is getting pushed down into the mud and the mud is taking over. Uh, and of course the base rock trails is very expensive. So we don't do that all the time. Um, but that's an example of one of the capital intensive projects that uh, we have on our list. And Howard has that list. I, I won't go through the whole thing, but like conservation, the, the, the trails committee, we operate on a pretty small budget. Um, because we're not paying for that work. That work's coming out of uh, Howard's uh, public works budget. And so um, when we look, and I know he has a copy, I think the town council has a copy. If not, we'll get you a copy of this prioritized uh, list. Um, we'll need to start thinking about when we can spend the money. Uh, this year, we've had a very lean budget. We, we knew that we couldn't go to the well for some of these big projects because of COVID, because of the uncertainty of what uh, uh, financing uh, we might have. But next year, we, we probably will put a couple of the projects uh, that are on the top of the list out uh, to Howard to, uh, to uh, budget, and hopefully we can get some of the money. You know, the, the, the trails, I got to step back and just say, we do so much with so little for our trails. Our trails are open to the public. They're not just open to Portola Valley residents. Anybody can come and use our trails. And we foot the bill. The town of Portola Valley foots the bill. I don't know of any other community that does it that way. Um, even Woodside, their, their trail network is somewhat private. Um, the portions of it are anyway, but ours is entirely open to the public. Uh, we, we, we've been looking at ways to get additional resources like through grants and using volunteer labor. We actually had a project scheduled uh, earlier this year that had to get canceled. It was one of our first volunteer trail days in a long time. It was gonna happen up at the ranch. 
and residents and, and uh, some, some uh, expert volunteers were going to uh, rework a portion of trail and the, the bottom line cost of the town would have been nothing. So we were excited that that was gonna happen, but we were also a little disappointed that it had to get canceled. So stay tuned because we'd like to find creative ways to help the town pay for the trails and the maintenance of the trails. We, we don't think this is something the town can sustain forever. It's, it, is, it, it can be very expensive uh, to maintain these trails. So we're trying to get creative and, and find ways to help with that. Uh, we, as you know, our annual um, public out outreach event, the, the horse fair, it was canceled uh, this past year and it's going to be canceled again this year. Uh, that needs to happen in the summertime, kind of aligned with when kids are in school. And uh, we typically do it on Mother's Day weekend, which uh, it, it works out really nice for families and, and kids to be able to get out and, and, and do all things equestrian. Um, most of you uh, probably know about the horse fair, but it's basically a um, event where we have uh, pony rides, carriage rides. We have a veterinarian there to teach kids about horses anatomy and they can listen to a horse's heartbeat. Uh, they can learn about 4-H programs and other programs uh, uh, like junior riders and Woodside where, where kids can get out and learn about horsemanship and learn how to ride. And of course we have the trails to do it on. Uh, you know, the equestrian culture is so deeply embedded in the history of our town. And it's something the trails committee just one of the facets of the Trails Committee, we have several, that we work very hard to keep alive. And the horse fair is kind of the vehicle that gets us there. And so um, I think we've been doing that for under 10,000 a, a year, which is a really good deal. We may increase that a little bit only because um, attendance has been growing. And that might reset our first time back as people have forgotten about it perhaps. But um, we anticipate it will keep growing. And so we, we need to accommodate a larger uh, crowd and keep them all busy. But uh, thanks to, uh, to Ellie Ferrari and Barb Eckstein who put that on, they, they, they carry the heavy load to do that. They're, they're the heavy lifters and they do such a phenomenal job. I just can't say enough about it. Uh, the Trails Committee is also working on the Stanford Housing, Stan Stanford Faculty Housing Project. And I'll just uh, give some high level objectives of what we're trying to accomplish there. Um, we're trying to, uh, of course, expand our trail network. Um, our trails came about through the subdivision process. So when this project came in front of us, to say we were, were excited was an understatement. We, we were salivating. We we're like, oh boy, new trails. <laughs> and, and so we, we um, of course, have been guided by the trails and paths element of the town's general plan, but we have committee members who know that land really, really well. You know, the, the, the Alpine Canyon Trail has existed there since the 60s. Uh, I, I'm friends with some people who grew up and went to school here, and, and they can recall riding their horses down there to get to uh, the Alpine Inn. So it's, it's a trail. The trail itself has a lot of history, and it's a really neat trail, but it's not on our trail map. Surprise, surprise, interesting. Uh, but uh, to make a long story short, that is part of, that'll be one of the main arteries into the wedge um, and connect the wedge to the Westridge neighborhood. So the traffic can flow easily between Westridge and the wedge. Traffic can flow from Westridge to Ford Field and traffic from wedge can flow um, up to Westridge and easily connect to Shady Trail, which gets them all the way over to Hidden Valley, uh, which literally can get you to the town center. So it's what, a, what an amazing opportunity we have to, to not just grow our, our trail network, but to uh, interconnect the neighborhoods, which is also one of our objectives. And our last objective is to offer a variety of trails to all of our different uh, trail user groups. You know, we have hikers, we have runners, we have baby buggies, we have equestrians, we have bicyclists, we have all kinds of people using the trails. And, and our mantra on the trails committee is something for everybody. And so we, we believe uh, wholeheartedly in that. And that is certainly one of the objectives um, for the Stanford Wedge project. Uh, beyond that, um, we are working on a couple of possibilities for new trails beyond the wedge. 
and that's uh, something to be determined. But um, we're working with um, the folks up at the Fogarty Winery who would like to connect their um, uh, tasting room to the trail system. Most of the trails, well, all of the trails up there are, are, are mid-pen uh, uh, trails. However, they are in the town of Portola Valley and they are very interested in, in uh, looking at uh, the possibility of granting a trail easement from Razorback Ridge to their tasting room. So that's something we're, we're working at. And uh, obviously uh, any trail is a priority, any new trail is a priority for us. And we look forward to, uh, uh, we're still at the very early stages of that, uh, and, and, but we hope we can move forward with it. And we look forward to the support from the council on um, efforts like that. And that's really all I have. Um, we are working close with conservation. I, 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 I can't uh, agree more with Judy that trails and conservation have so many of their interests aligned. And so we support conservation in practically everything they do. Um, when they need us, we join them for meetings. When, when we need them, they're at our meetings. Uh, in fact, they've been sending a, a representative pretty regularly. We appreciate that. Um, we, we look forward to continue that tight relationship with conservation because uh, I think trails and conservation really, they go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, I'm excited about all those new trails too. Does anybody on your committee wish to speak or is there anybody in the audience from your committee? Do you see any hands, Jeremy? I don't see any hands, ma'am. No hands. Okay, what about council members? Do you have a question or a comment for Gary? I just Fred. comment as the liaison to trails for a bit over a year now. Um, it's been uh, enjoyable and I think the committee does great work and um, looking forward to working with you guys for another year. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And, and I, I just would add to that that, you know, we, we see Craig as an honorary member of our trails committee. Um, you, you kind of talked about the role of liaison in the past. Uh, we, we've kind of knocked down all barriers and we, we feel that, you know, Craig is really one of us and he can comment on anything that we're doing. And we, we of course, use him as a resource and he's a conduit back to the uh, town council. But he's very much a member of our committee. And, and we hope that you feel that way, Craig, because we, we value you in that way. I, I don't get to vote, but otherwise, yes, I, I do feel very included by you guys. Thank you. Good. That's really uh, nice to hear. Through the chair, I do see a raised hand from uh, Dave Ross. Dave. You need to unmute it. You're in. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Good evening. Nice to be part of this meeting. I may not be participating very much. I'm a little under the weather, but I did want to thank the trails committee and the volunteers on it and the public work staff for the incredible job they do keeping the trails up and also thank everybody on behalf of nancy powell my wife who spends i'd say on average three hours a day on the trails in zippity. Um, in zippity. <laughs> on some of the trails yes <laughs> last year fitbit reports that she uh had uh, 5.8 million steps. I'm certain that 5.5 .5 million of those were on the trails. Um, and I also believe that Nancy was on the trails committee back in the early 1980s. So uh, on behalf of our family, thank you for doing an incredible job. Thank you, Dave. That's that's really impressive. 5.8 million steps. Whoa. Okay, anything else from anyone for Gary? Yes, Sarah. I'm just gonna make a comment because I've been you know, learning a lot about all the committees over the last couple months since, since I started. And um, I've really enjoyed a lot about what I've learned about the trails committee. And I just wanted to make a, I was happy to hear you Gary say that the trails are for all the different use cases in town, whether it be baby buggies or dog walkers or bikers or equestrians or hikers. Um, for some reason, some of the people I've talked to have, have told me, oh, they assumed the trails committee was an equestrian committee. Um, and I'm hearing loud and clear from you, you know, and um, your representation of the mission of the trails committee that that's not true and that 
you know, it's representative. I'm sure all the, the I don't know a lot of the members on your committee, but I'm sure they represent, you know, all the different uses of the people on the trails. So I just wanted to make a comment about that. I think it's great. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Sarah. And, and yes, we do. We, we, we pride, I guess, pride ourselves. We, we feel really good about the fact that we have uh, all groups well represented on the committee. And, and that's something that works to our, our advantage every time we meet. So thank you for, for seeing that. And, and, and that's by design and we hope it stays that way. Okay, thanks Gary. And again, I agree with your comment that the trails have saved people's lives and I've never seen so many people on the trails as I've seen in the last year. And it's nice. Okay. Are we um, on to historic resource? Committee? Yeah, Nancy Lund, you're next. And then uh, Michael Tomars from the uh, Ad Hoc Wildfire Preparedness Committee will be after that. Okay, Nancy. Nancy, you are muted. It looks like you're unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Looks like muted again, right? Yeah. Well. Hmm. Nancy, if you can hear me, this is Jeremy, um, uh, you're welcome to uh, pop out of the meeting and come back in and I will um, uh, call on you. If we can't get that to work, I will reach out tomorrow and make sure that um, the council gets any information that you have, um, or we can come up with an alternative way to get that to the council at the next meeting as well. Uh, okay. With your permission, Marianne, I can move to Michael. Okay. Um, and then after that, um, as I described earlier, um, Dave Ross asked me to um, uh, share some thoughts from the ASCC. All right. Yep. Michael Tomars, Wildfire. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm technologically challenged tonight. I can't figure out why my video is not working, so I apologize for that. This has been a very trying day for technology at this household. <laughs> yeah, one of those days. Um, okay, so essentially, um, this is a committee that has taken great strides in going from zero to 60 in a very short period of time, becoming experts in a field that um, quite possibly I can say that none of us were experts when we started. We have um, committed ourselves to trying to bring the town into a better place um, in responding and being prepared for these type of events. But in doing so, we've had to identify the primary risks. And that list continues to evolve, especially given what we saw um, this past fall with the CZU complex. And then we review obviously all of our current mitigation measures in addressing those risks. We consider the impacts of um, on both public and private lands. Um, it's a holistic approach. We examine you know, all the educational opportunities that are available and any incentive programs that we can tap. And we, in our mission, we, we wrap in all the material input that we get and we reach out to multiple stakeholders. So it's, 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 a, it's a very um, large task <laughs> for um, lack of better words, um, but it is something that we have embraced. Um, one thing I would like to say is um, throughout the year, we have definitely placed more emphasis on the vegetation management aspect of our committee. Our committee is comprised of three subcommittees um, dealing with uh, communication evacuation being one, um, home hardening insurance infrastructure being the second and vegetation management defensible space being the third. So as I said, we've placed the emphasis on vegetation management and then home hardening. Um, 
one of the things that I'd like to just bring um, to the uh, front of our discussion is I know that we were working very hard in our initial year to uh, tackle the home hardening issue by putting through what we believe were essential code modifications. And we just would like to sort of understand as a committee, um, and I've gotten this question, you know, where are those? And kind of what is the process for getting that to the finish line? Um, we are very close to February of 2021. And these were items that were approved um, in uh, 2019. So I just, I know that the staff is, is, is got a lot going on and, 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 and I, you know, I, if I could give the staff additional resources, I would, but I think every member of our committee would like to know um, a little bit more about if there's something with respect to the code adoptions that's problematic and just sort of understand what the process is going forward. So we know when we can reach the finish line on that initiative. Um, with respect to vegetation management, I think we made incredible strides in October of last year, um, building upon issues that we tackled um, in our initial year. But with respect to that, um, I think the, the, I don't wanna call it the jewel in the crown, but maybe I should, um, is the, the large, uh, um, it's the, uh, the large land owner um, adoption, which was, I think we called it the undeveloped land. That would be acreage of 50 acres or more, um, having to have a vegetation management plan in place that would be reviewed by Woodside Fire and inspected periodically. Um, this affected um, Windy Hill under Midpen Coal Mine Ridge under Portola Valley Ranch and Blue Oaks, um, the Wedge, um, mid, uh, Hawthorns, El Mirador, and Neely. So, you know, this is this is going to take effort because um, actually, I, I had a call with Don Bullard this week just to sort of review the steps that we need to take to get this to the finish line, and the sub the subcommittee or the committee as a whole will have to develop a template. Um, vegetation management plan. And in relation to that, there would have to be some sort of agreement that would accompany that. So the template plan would outline various aspects of what should be included in the plan. And then the agreement would just be something that's done on an annual certification basis to ensure that the plan is being followed. Um, this, is, this is on the top of my list of things to do. <laughs> So um, if, if you wanna know what I'm gonna be burning the midnight oil on, it's that. <laughs> um, there are other aspects of what happened in October that were easier to put in place, um, such as restricting vegetation within 10 feet of underground transformers, banning the flammable five, which are junipers, cypress, acacia, pine, eucalyptus, and expanding the defensible space from 100 to 200 feet for slopes of more than 30 degrees. Um, and then the right of way cleanup through target hazard trees and underbrush. So those, those are things that were approved and those are items that were approved in October. Um, and I use the word approved because I'm, I'm assuming that they were approved because I'm working on them. <laughs> uh, but I, I would think that if you look at all of that, I'm gonna be very busy and the committee will be busy um, putting through the, the 50 acre um, initiative. And I'll, we'll be working quite closely with Wood, Woodside Fire in, in doing that. Uh, as far as funds, <laughs> when we've been thinking about all of the things that we're doing, we've tried, and Jeremy can attest to this, we've tried to keep it revenue neutral. So the, the ideas that we're coming up with don't require per se a dedicated budget, but honestly speaking, um, a budget would help because some of these items are difficult to accomplish on a timely basis unless funds are available. Mm -hmm. And if we wanna prioritize that so that we get the biggest bang for the buck, the committee will be working during the first quarter of this year in um, developing and crystallizing um, those types of ideas. So the town council should see some, some product coming out of that. 
um, I, you know, I, I really would like to make this interactive and I'm uh, not afraid to answer questions since you can't see the expression on my face when I get the question. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Do, do um, council members have questions? Yes, Jeff. I don't have a question. I just I just want to point out as the representative of this committee that um, th this group, you know, they hit the ground running of a year and a half ago now and um, have I've they took on a big task, a lot of them actually, and uh, they actually went out and found more big tasks to take on, but they've done it with a lot of energy. And um, Michael, I think I'm sensing a little bit of frustration in the pace that things are going. I have to say that I think when you get into things like code adoption and, and, and some of our processes, we're actually, this group has moved at, 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 at warp speed. Um, it's just, this stuff takes a long time. Um, thank you for both your patience and your sort of continual insistence that we keep moving on things. Um, both are, are appreciated. Um, again, I think this whole committee has done a lot of great work. It's an impressive group. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with them. Thank you, Jeff, for your gracious comments. <laughs> Appreciate it. So what Jeff is referring to that you are frustrated about, is that the um, fire code work? Yeah, these, these are the home hardening. Um, yeah, the home hardening yeah. to go into the code. That's it, right? Yeah, Where yeah. I, go ahead. I, I, I just, I'm just, I think it's super, I'm going to be really, really pedestrian about it. It's super important. <laughs> and I just, I would like to see it happen sooner than later. Um, I, I you know, and I, I, I feel for everyone, be, myself being a public servant, I understand the process. I do understand the process and I know um, how long it can take. But I just want to emphasize that I, I really do believe that getting the code adoption in place will serve the town so well. Um, I just would hate to see um, missteps um, because we don't have the code in place. I, I can tell you, for example, just based on uh, you know feedback that I've seen on the forum, as well as um, feedback I've gotten from other committee members, there have been people that have adopted and believe that this is definitely going in the right direction and people have replaced their wood shake roofs. This is great. I mean, we can actually tell you the numbers. I don't have that in front of me. Um, we've had people inquire about, can I put on a metal roof? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, people are really thinking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very exciting. Um, they're, they're taking it in and they're acting upon it. And um, I, I just think it would be great if we could move um, the government, the governmental process to support it. Uh, and yeah, no, and believe me, absolutely no criticism to the staff at all. If anything, more kudos to the staff and more power to them to move this forward. Jeremy, yes, could you give us a little update on what's happening there? Sure, I'm happy to. And in tonight's uh, packet too, there was a, a third quarterly report uh, for these activities, so they were included. But I'm happy to give some further uh, color on this particular issue. So. Um, you know, Michael's correct. The council adopted the recommendations at the very end of 2019. It was the last meeting of the year of 2019. Um, we had not started um, the drafting of that when COVID came, and obviously there was a delay in a variety of land use related um, endeavors. Uh, we don't have internally a building code um, uh, staff. We, we contract these services out, both the uh, building inspector and the building official services is needed. So in um, late summer, um, I um, started work on this uh, with uh, um, someone from a, a consulting firm as a former building official. And he and uh, the fire marshal and I spent um, a good portion of the fall and, and um, early winter uh, drafting this, I have a, I have a draft copy of it. Um, it's been delayed in going to the ASCC and the Planning Commission, pr primarily the Planning Commission, because there were other major items that the Planning Commission um, was looking at over the last period of time, particularly the Stanford Wedge project. So um, I'm in a final phase of review uh, at my end of looking at that. I'm hoping um, that we can bring this to the Planning Commission actually in the next month-ish 
Um, I don't want to commit to a particular date. I want to work uh, with the planning director on that, but that's how close we are to it. Um, it would go through um, one, perhaps two meetings at the planning commission and then come to the council. Um, as, uh, as I think Michael recalls, um, the, um, the recommendation um, uh, was uh, kind of twofold. One was related to new construction and having um, five, um, five or six um, particular home hardening measures in place for new construction. And then there was uh, a second piece, which was related to the design guidelines um, for ASCC to encourage people to do it in the future. And um, in light of last year's events, particularly around the CZU fire, um, I made a decision in the drafting of the, uh, of the building code to draft it a little stronger to reflect um, 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 a more sizable effort to get some of these things underway. It's intended to spur a conversation with the planning commission and the council to see what level of um, strictness they want on this to, to be candid. Um, so these would be measures tied to um, um, what percentage of your, uh, potentially what percentage of your home you're doing in a remodel or the like. So it's, I think, a, a, a robust conversation that the planning commission, the council is going to have about this. It's pretty radical approach that the wildfire committee um, suggested and that we've, we've run with. Um, but, you know, CZU, I think really got us all sort of thinking like, is this enough? Let, let's, let's draft it maybe even a little bit more strongly. We'll have it also go to the wildfire committee when they're ready to meet. Um, so I'm hoping that that'll happens fairly quickly. Um, that was reflected in tonight's uh, quarterly report. Thank you. Okay, and then after it goes to council, if we approve it, then it goes into effect? Yeah, uh, what is there, Cara, is there 30 days on building code? Yeah, that's correct. And then we'll need to forward it to the, the state um, building official. Okay. But uh, assuming that um, we can make the local findings, they don't have, it, it's basically just a rubber stamp. They, they don't have any discretionary authority over it. Right. Okay. So I, I you know, to, to reflect, I think what Michael was, was saying, I think we all share the, the frustrations and not moving those along sooner. Certainly COVID took a huge chunk out of last year's opportunity to get this done sooner, but it's been something we've been working on for um, about five months at this point. And um, I think that that will come to fruition very quickly for everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to give the update. Michael, does that make you feel a little bit better? It does. I'm gonna have some green tea. Thanks. <laughs> That's very helpful. And thank you, Jeremy, for the update. I mean, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I, I think, we all, yeah, we, we all share, you know, we all share the concern and, um, and, it, you know, I, I focused on some things apart from the building code. It's, it's kind of, it, it's moved off my pile, so I don't keep an eye on it. And now hearing that context and sort of understanding where it is in the flow chart makes me feel better. So that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know if there's any questions though. Um, I mean, one other thing I could comment on, if there's any specific priorities that the council perceives that they would like the committee to focus on just based upon items that you've heard from residents or um, any input that you've had from experts that, may, that we may not be aware of, you know, we definitely want, um, we're, we're wanting of that kind of information. So if there's something that we should add to our list of things to do. Does anyone have an idea for something to do that they are not, that is not already on the list? Nope. Nothing obvious. No. Okay, if anything comes to us, we'll let you know. But right now we feel good about your list. Thank you very but much. Does anyone else want to speak? Is Karen still on the Zoom? If you want to speak, Karen, raise your hand. If not, that is totally fine. Yeah, you don't have to. Nope. I think we're good. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And then are we finishing with Dave Ross's comments? Yeah, um, so I'm going to do that on on his uh, behalf, and I, I um, I'm referring to um, the minutes of their uh, the draft minutes of their of their uh, most recent meeting. 
Okay, um, so this is the ASCC. Yes, this is the ASCC. Dave Ross is the chair. Dave Ross is not going to join us tonight because he's under the weather and you are going to give his comments. Correct. Thank you. So there was a discussion at their uh, July, excuse me, their January 11th meeting um, and the chair invited the committee members to share their thoughts on the items that they'd like to see worked on in the coming year. So I wanna go through those. Some have a relationship directly with budget, some have a relationship to uh, staff time and the like. Um, and there is some cross-pollination here on some other efforts. Um, the uh, Vice Chair Jane Wilson uh, made some comments wanting to see a pre-approved, pre-constructed ADU plan available for um, residents so they didn't have to pay so much for the design of ADUs. I know that this is something that uh, Council Member Richards has asked as well. The um, Planning and Building Director uh, mentioned that some work had happened, but it had been put aside at one point. Um, so that's an area that the ACC would like to see some focus on. Um, Commissioner Al Sill um, uh, wanted to uh, ensure that the design guidelines were aligned uh, with fire safety. Um, and this is a recommendation that came out of the uh, Wildfire Preparedness Committee. So that um, uh, aligns with their work. Um, it, uh, we can certainly have that on um, next year's uh, work plan. Um, for the uh, planning department. Um, then um, uh, the newest commissioner, Commissioner Chung, um, stated his interest in seeing that wildfire safety continue to be thought about as it relates to the design guidelines and general plan update, which will come probably in a few years. Um, the, um, uh, the chair um, also uh, discussed his interest in, uh, as he put it, harmonizing the wildfire safety issues with the design guidelines. Um, and as some people commented earlier, he commented on how there's really been a sea change in the way people have approached uh, tree issues in town. Um, so that that would something that would be included in the ACC design guidelines. Um, and um, uh, just going through this very quickly to see if there's other elements here. Um, those are the primary items that I see um, from their um, from their discussion. The other item that Chair Ross mentioned was um, discouraging homeowners from doing the things that they were um, uh, required not to do when they got their plans approved and their permits approved. So I think an example of that would be when um, the ASCC says, you know, don't put don't put in this particular lighting, and then six months later that lighting is put in. So um, Cara and Laura and I have had some pretty substantial conversations around this issue actually. Um, and we're uh, in, in the coming months, I think we'll have some things that we wanna bring to ASCC to talk about that and what we can put in place. Um, I think that's it. Um, so these are all um, these are all items that have been discussed by the committee in the past. Excuse me, the commission in the past, and there has been some staff work on some of them. Um, and as the council moves forward on its priorities, um, the ACC asks that you include them as part of yours. I hope I got all that right, Dave. Thank you. You're muted, Marianne. Do you have any questions for Jeremy? Dave just raised his hand, so I might have gotten something wrong. <laughs> Let me uh, correct Jeremy. Unmute. Please correct me, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. No corrections. I just wanted to put the last priority into context, which is in general, looking at the available enforcement mechanisms for ensuring that carefully crafted ASCC and planning department approvals persist. Uh, and that covers really a wide range of things from uh, specific landscape planning that was um, removed during the approval process, uh, lighting, um, change in materials and designs, uh, stuff that sort of slips under the radar uh, after the building permit is finaled uh, staff does a great job, and I want to call out Carol Bork for the job that she does in inspecting projects on behalf of the planning department 
before final building approval is granted. Uh, and, you know, she, she often notes issues that uh, come back to at least one of us for some attention and uh, discussion before she is willing to uh, finalize the planning department's inspection. Uh, but of course, after the building permit is finaled, there is no further enforcement mechanism. It's just on the uh, good faith of the applicant. And sometimes that good faith gives way to strongly held wishes, uh, even if they run very counter to the uh, town's design guidelines. Uh, and probably one of the biggest problems is nighttime lighting. And uh, so I just want to thank you, Jeremy, for uh, listing all those things for me. Um, uh, other presenters have done a great job of going through the priorities, and I simply don't have the energy tonight. But I appreciate you uh, reading off the list. Thanks a bunch. My pleasure. Thanks, Dave. OK, anything else from the council? And did I want to ask just a general question to the council. Did you hear any ideas that you really liked and want to work on? Or do you have any concluding comments or thoughts? John? Um, I, I think most of the items that were covered were um, I was familiar with. Um, I, I think there was a lot of uh, evidence of continuing continuing really hard work on on part of all these committees. Um, I think if, if anything, uh, let's see. No, I I, I mean, don't have any additional editorial comments at this point. Jeff, do you have any? Um, I just want to thank all of the committee chairs as usual for putting sort of the effort and um, I think anybody listening sees the sort of thoughtfulness that goes into this and something that we see over the entire year with this group. So um, I did not see anything. I mean, I feel like one of our, you know, I, I think of my role as liaison is just to sort of in some ways kind of manage expectations on parts of committees and just make sure that whatever they're working on, they, they know, you know, they know how it's you know what, what's what's going to happen to it as it comes forward just so there's you know it may not be always what they want to hear but it's hopefully no surprises um so i what i've heard is is very much in line with things that we've i think we've been hearing over the course of the year so thank you again craig yeah i um i'm always very impressed uh you know hearing about all the work that's going on on the committees that i've not liaison for I, i'm i'm very aware of all the work mine do um and it's uh reminds me every time how much work that offloads from us and staff and so it's it's um super helpful to have all of these committees as engaged as they are taking on these tasks and uh, going and doing the work of, of figuring all this stuff out um because without all that work most of it wouldn't get done um, so, um, you know, I look forward to uh, continuing this uh, budget setting process. I think these meetings um, are definitely helpful to um, get the feedback from the committees and get it into the budget process at the right time. Um, so um, I think this meeting this year has been at least as good as the one last year um, and is setting us on a good path. Thanks, Craig. Sarah, new eyes, anything? I've, you know, I, I've tried to go to a lot of committee meetings just to kind of um, upload myself um, over the last month or so. Um, and so I just wanna echo that it's fantastic that there's so many great volunteers doing this really important work. Um, I have noticed, especially in, in the documents tonight, there are a lot of vacancies. And so a um, thought I have is just, you know, how do we get more people involved, new people involved? Um, and backfill, um, you know, the positions on the committees. Um, so that's just the, the one kind of additional thought that has been in my mind. It's something that I'd love to try and help out with. And um, I don't know, got to figure out a way to reach out a little bit more. Well, we will tap you because 
we agree. We've got a lot of vacancies and we've got to fill them. Right. And you're going to be um, in communication with a demographic that might be at a point where maybe their kids are going to college. Right. They have a little break, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, what else? Uh, may uh, I? I? Oh, sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. No, I, I was going to, one thing did occur to me, actually. I mean, several committees are talking about their events. And I guess just in terms of budgeting and planning, just thinking about that possibility out there that some of, you know, some of our live events might actually come back this year or more realistically, maybe in the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So it feels like, I mean, we've, we've, we've had to, you know, our budgets have gotten thrown into disarray over this past year. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe one of our things to think about as we set this budget for the upcoming fiscal year is just if and when some of those live events will come back. I mean, I, I kind of like John's idea about having some sort of bigger event, um, you know, as part of this kind of trying to get, trying to sort of get people back out of their houses again when it's safe. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen. So it's kind of hard to, to be more than just kind of a placeholder somewhere in the budget, but it's just, when I think about everything I've heard, it just really occurs to me that just some way of thinking about what it's going to look like when we can actually start having some events again. It's kind of surreal because it's been so long since we've been out gathering with others. Yeah. The idea yeah. of an event, yeah. Anything else? Well, I think it's clear that we are very unique as a town to have so many committees, so many volunteers, and you know, 50, how many years since incorporation is it now? Seven. 57 years? Almost 57. We're still keeping it going. It's really remarkable. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on anything they've heard about tonight? Do you see any hands? Not at this time. Let's give it another second. Okay. Uh, yep, hands to, are to come up. Here Nancy Land can try to get back in. Yeah, let me see if she's here. Nancy, I'm gonna here. allow you to talk. There you go. Nancy, why don't you try unmuting? I'm here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a different computer. I don't understand what's, what happened. It's this, the little sign said um, I wasn't showing and it said that the camera didn't work. And then I clicked on unmute and I had my little square and I clicked on mute and the other. So I went to a different computer and now I just see eight people. So I don't know. Do you want to hear my report now at the end of everything? Yes, we'd love to hear your, your report. Okay. Well, our job, of course, is to gather up the information, to keep track of what's going on in town, to record it, to organize it in some way so that we can find it again if somebody needs to know something and then to be useful to people who want to know something that we happen to have information about. Last year we had um, 37 people come with questions of one thing or another. And I hope that you all feel that free to come and ask us. We're there from usually from Thursday afternoons from three to five working away on the files and um, we're always happy if we can provide information that does something to make your work easier. We have really two different sets of things. I've never had a chance to really tell you how much we have, but um, there's the digital collection and then there's the non-digital collection. Most of our photos are digitized. They're organized into 120 different categories. Um, we have a digital database to identify also all of the photos. Um, and we have some 13,000 entries in the digital database. But what we don't have is we don't have a way to go to the database and then to click on the item and then that will take you to the photo or the map or whatever the digital item is. So that potentially could become an issue for an expense because um, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to link those up. So we would have to um, find an expert. We do have a digital database for the non-digital items. I don't know if we call them analog items anymore, but um, we have um, 3,165 
items in our little digital card catalog for things that are housed in a in a four drawer file cabinets. And um, in addition to that, we have the special Regnery collection, which is the work that was done by Dorothy Regnery, who was historian before I, and her records are of the early Hispanic times, early Anglo times on this land. And that has 743 card catalog digital um, ways to search that. So um, in addition to those things, we have um, the bound issues of the Almanac from 1967 until they went digital in 2002, I believe. And for people who haven't been around forever, the Almanac used to have maybe 40 pages, maybe 50 pages instead of 28. And there were articles on reporting on council meetings and school board meetings and sporting events. And so that is a, a record of the history of the area that's regional for our five little towns here. And so it's a very precious, very precious resource. We also have negatives that go with the photos from the various issues of the paper. And we have an old fashioned card file of um, articles. So you can, there are various ways you can search through the almanacs if there's something that you wanna know there. Um, the other part of our job um, as we see it is to keep an eye on our historic resources. And so, for example, last year we oversaw a placement of a historic marker on the Mangini Roadhouse, that little stone building that was the first town hall at um, Alpine Hills, and a historic marker on Harry Hallett's store, which is a modern interpretation of his store from the turn of the century when a little village of Portola was here. Um, we have one historic resource that is a great worry to me, and it's been a worry to me for, for many years, is the, the Allen Woods property, the Hawthorns, mm -hmm. 80 acres that <clears throat> extends from Long Alpine Road and Los Trancos Road. Um, that 80 acres was bequeathed to post about 15 years ago, and they passed it on to Mid Penn, who had a study done by architectural historians, and they say they classify this property, the 11 acres, which is a, a historic preserve of the 80 acres. Um, they consider that of, of importance enough to be listed on the national, eligible for being listed on the national <coughs> historic places. So it's a priceless resource to our town and Midpen is having a hard time finding a partner to deal with it. Um, there's, a, there's a mansion, there's a falling apart, wonderful barn. There's a garage, which we believe is a Ju strong evidence that it's a Julia Morgan design. Another building that maybe was the schoolhouse for the first, the first owner's kids. Um, so it's there and it is um, subject to attack by bees and by rats and by the weather. Um, Midpen has tried to find a partner to oversee it, to restore the buildings and occupy them for their purposes. And they're having trouble finding somebody. They had a family that was going to do it and that fell through. <coughs> they had another family that fell through. A group of people from town wanted to put in a proposal to them to become a partner and use it as a town resource, as a historic place for a history museum, uh, nature center, a place for a garden club to work. Uh, the scouts were interested in a place where they could have activities, uh, maybe community gardens. And they did not take our proposal. They went with the family instead, believing it's more in terms with the keeping of the bequest and the conservation easements. But now um, they don't have any plans for a partner. They don't have anybody and they're not sure exactly what they're going to do I don't know if there's anybody in town with the energy and leadership to try to bring that up again. But in the meantime, it's an expense for them. They have to keep it in a state of arrested 
decay and their mission is not historic preservation, it's open space preservation. So my fear is that they're going to say, we've done the best we can. We can't find anybody. The buildings are falling apart. They become an attractive nuisance. We're going to come for a demolition permit. And that would be a sad loss for not only our town, but the region. So that's my report. Yeah, I remember you talking about this years ago, Nancy. <coughs> I forget her name, but she and I went up there and I actually climbed up and went through the window and then opened a door to let her in. And we um, ro roamed around the house and yet there was a lot of rat evidence then, but it was a magnificent place, just stunning. And I agree, it would be tragedy if it was torn down. So I talked to them last week and I said I would bring it up to the, at the committee meeting and see if maybe somebody from the committees would come up with some idea, not necessarily for it to be a town use, which would be a, a huge undertaking, although I think it would ultimately be wonderful if we could actually meet all the terms that, that exist. And maybe somebody else who wants to take it on as a place to live in. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Nancy? Okay, does anybody, oh, Jeremy does. Well, not a question, just a, a thank you to Nancy. Um, one of the, it's amazing when you go through various experiences the things that you learn, <laughs> things that struck Nancy and I right around the time of the CZU fire was that we did not have in place a, a formal plan to address saving the, the town's heritage. And Nancy spent some uh, very valuable time after the, the fire to come up with the plan um, that we would implement um, in case uh, the, the town was in danger from a fire. Um, well, the and, thanks goes to Jim Lipman for that, not me. So well, give him credit. We'll give Jim credit as well, <clears throat> but uh, really important. Um, I mean, these are obviously um, irreplaceable items. Um, so I was very thankful to uh, work with, with Nancy and Jim on, on that planning effort. Yeah, I've thought about that one time. What would happen to all those documents? Mm -hmm. So now there's a plan. There's a plan. Great. Yeah. Going uh, back to... Yeah, going back to the Hawthorns, um, Nancy, I'm familiar with all the ins and outs of the various parties over the last couple of years in particular. Um, has there been any very proactive outreach within the town to Nancy's point to see if there's interested parties in, in taking on a project there? I'm just wondering, you know, I know until it came to my attention about three years ago, I've lived here 15 years, and until it came to my attention three years ago for an unrelated thing, um, I never knew it was there. Um, and I think, I don't know, focus group of one, I just assume a lot of people in town don't really even know it's there. And so, I don't know, I just thought as you were talking, Nancy, I was just wondering if there's ever been a very proactive push to to shine light on that resource that's in town and to see because it obviously was an enormous undertaking um it was, only, it was only that time when they put out the request for proposals and the little committee was formed and there's been really no point since then because they've been under contract with the first family and then the second family so it wasn't available but it is now available again so So to your yeah. question, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that it's been several years since we had anything, any sort of public discussions about it. I, I, I can't, I can even tell you. I'm, I was on the, I was sort of working with the group that was thinking about a proposal there, and I can't remember when that was. It was probably at least four years ago. Okay. The council did not express any interest in the, in the, at the beginning of that five years ago time when the committee, when there was the little committee called Friends of Hawthorns. 
that seriously wanted to um, take it on. And yeah, I think just, it was. It's not been available since. I think it was the financial burden. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, you need somebody with deep pockets to take the project on. Is there anything else? Well, thank you, Nancy, for the work that you do that is just exquisite. Sure. And I look forward to post-COVID when I can go in. I would actually want to find an article I wrote for the Almanac in about 2000, and I can't find it online because they weren't digitized then. Is that why I can't find it? Maybe. OK, but obviously you've got it. Good luck. Yeah. All right, thank you all. I guess with that, we will adjourn the workshop. Through the, I'm sorry, through the chair, yeah, we have, have three hands. hands. Oh, I'm sorry, next step. Yeah. Sorry, Jeremy. Yeah, so first uh, we have uh, three, looks like four hands raised now. Uh, Judy Murphy's the first. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say that Nancy reminds us of this attempt to use the old um, structures at Hawthorne for town use that was on the table a few years ago. And that um, it was wildly expensive because the historic nature and it like, seems like way too much for the town to take on. But more recently, as we've looked at other issues around town, there's this desperate need for increased space at town center. You know, the library wants more space, the office wants more space, the, emergency services needs more <laughs> so that it seems to me that given uh, how up, up front we've come with our need to have more space for town facilities and the impossibility of creating that on the current town campus without really um, damaging <laughs> the aesthetics of the campus as it is or without an, another enormous expense, putting another story on one of those buildings, et cetera, that the, um, the sort of cost benefit analysis of looking again at Hawthorne's for that multi-use for the town, especially if you could subdivide it somehow so that part of it could get leased out to someone who would carry some of the, some of the financial weight that wasn't a town person. I don't know the ins and outs of it legally, but I would, I'd suggest that we not just um, throw it out out of hand because we looked at it once before when circumstances were a little bit different. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Who else? And then we have uh, Christy Corley, Mayor. Christy. Hi, I just wanted to say I've been um, going to some of these committees and I'm so impressed with some of the people that are leading and I wanted to thank you for your leadership on those committees. Um, some of you have been doing it for over 20 years and some 40 and I'm just amazed at the commitment to the town. So thank you all for doing that. And um, I am noticing the bike and traffic committee is not on here. Is it a committee? Is it a resident committee? Okay, maybe they you can answer. They are a committee, but they did not attend tonight. Oh, because I think they're so important because oh. yeah. in looking at some of the pedestrian reports that I was reading, we've had some biking accidents and we have a lot of external biking people coming through town and it is of a concern. So, and traffic as well. So. I would have, I was looking forward to hearing that report and, uh, and um, I, you're saying it's a committee, but they're just not here tonight. Correct. Okay. Not every committee is represented here tonight. Okay. I just hey, Christy, I'm, I'm the liaison to the BPTS and I do generally provide um, monthly reports to the council as the BPTS has their meetings, I attend them and then report to the council on all of their proceedings. So we haven't heard from them tonight about their plans for this upcoming year because they weren't able to attend. But in terms of the sort of historic, you know, what they've been doing, the council has generally kept pretty up to date on that. 
Okay. Um, and then I guess that Hawthorne space, my son was able to go to uh, through scouts or when he did his scout project. And it's a mystery to me and I'm curious about it. Is there even like tours or could we do trails so the residents can experience it or walk through it once? Maybe historian committee can do some walks and history on the buildings. I don't know. I think it'd be fun to see because it's right across from the market that I go to every day and I'm curious about it. Um, just a suggestion. And then uh, you all were saying there's lots of openings on the committees and I was seeing uh, the Almanac had a list for Woodside committees and I thought, okay, well, Portola Valley is going to list there soon. So maybe you're privy to how many openings there are on each committee and uh, I'm not sure we all are as residents. So curious on that and we all want to get involved as our kids move move away and have their own careers. And I'm kind of looking around, seeing what, what would be a fit for me um, and look forward to participating at some point. Thank you, Christy. Dave Cardinal. Okay, am I unmuted now? There you go. Oh, great, perfect. Uh, first, I'm as always blown away by the depth of the volunteer spirit in the town. So bless everyone who contributes. Uh, the one thing that struck me out of all the committee reports is the trails committee saying that they might not have the budget to maintain some of the trails. And I wish I used them 10 times more than I did, but personally compared to what we spend for paving roads or whatever, I would be totally in favor of whatever amount we need to keep the trails running. I think they're a tiny investment for a great reward. So that's my only comment on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Betsy. Thank you, Mayor. And I just wanted to um, to say that I, I, I have such a pride of place in people tonight. I think this has just been such a successful meeting. Thank you for uh, shining the light on all the committees. There are some that I uh, try to attend regularly, but there are others that I don't. And being able to see the overview and the remarkable um, depth and breadth of engagement and creativity is just marvelous. I almost didn't make tonight and I'm so glad I did. I just hope our numbers as, are as high tonight um, as they have ever been so others can share in, in this day. Thanks so much to everyone who makes this such an incredible place to live. Thank you, Betsy. Are there any, I don't see any other hands. No other hands. Okay. Next steps, Jeremy. Thank you. So wanted to briefly go over um, essentially the time um, um, schedule here over the next few months. Um, and did want to add an item as there were a few committees that were unable to attend tonight, I will be reaching out to them to uh, at the very least ensure that I can transmit to the council their, their thoughts um, and if we have an opportunity to bring them on uh, February 12th, I will endeavor to do that. The next um, formal meeting on the budget is set for the 24th. It is a, a study session on the priority um, setting process for the council. This has been going on about five, six years now at the council level. And this is the document that helps inform the budget um, as drafted by staff. Um, the annual reports from the committees come in the April, May timeframe. So you get to hear about all the wonderful things that committees have worked on. And there will obviously be a relationship between some of the things that they're asking uh, for um, funding for in the coming year. The priority setting process is finalized as uh, the mayor said in April, likely the first meeting in April. And at that point, uh, the staff would and the liaisons would be sharing the priorities with uh, the committee members so they know um, if there's any additional work to do or to let them know where, where things are. 
And then the draft budget, um, we typically bring it in June. I put May here as a draft because um, there, this is the first year that we're gonna be including some forecasting um, and some trend analysis, and that might require some um, earlier analysis. So May is, is, is a possibility for the first insights into the draft budget uh, moving forward. So that is what the next couple months will look like. And just as a representative of all the staff, I really wanna thank the committees for all the work that they do. We um, have a, uh, the privilege of liaisoning with them on a variety of projects and um, I appreciate all the committee members and chairs who keep us um, um, on the tasks that we need to be working on and educate us on a daily basis about all the wonderful things that are happening in town. So just on behalf of the staff, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. And I think the council echoes all those sentiments. So now I would like to adjourn the workshop. And before we move on to item 11, is it okay if we take a little five minute break? Sure. Yes, that'd be great. Thanks. See you back at uh, 926. Five, 926. Item number 11 is a donation program for small scale town projects, formerly PV Donates. Jeremy. Thank you. So this is an idea that has been in an incubation period at the staff level for some time. And it came out of initial thinking that the town has had incredible success at very targeted donations from residents. I think the two programs that people are the most familiar with are the donations that made the town center possible, but also donations that come on a, on a, a semi-regular basis to the open space acquisition fund. These are um, incredibly important relationships that the town has developed with residents who care passionately about the continued success here in particular types of ways. Um, open space though has been, I think the, the one that's been the most, most popular. Um, the staff uh, considering um, how that's been successful and also uh, was thinking about how um, as committees evolve over time and um, uh, specifically as some committee members have um, aged out and don't have um, the opportunity to be as hands-on as, as perhaps that they want that they had been in the past. We were thinking about other ways that residents could contribute some sort of resource to the town, um, and how to expand that list in a, in a way that might be meaningful to to residents. So this staff report and the attachment um, are an attempt to give some color to the concept. So we wanted to bring this to you tonight to get your first impressions of uh, what you think of the, the idea. Um, certainly any specific information or ideas, um, suggestions that you wanted to share related to the attachment and the types of programs um, and the types of um, initiatives that people could donate towards. This is not intended to be uh, all inclusive and it's also not intended to mean that everything on the list should be considered either. These are just uh, sort of brainstorm ideas to get your juices flowing related to this. So I hope that that um, gives some sense of what we were thinking. Um, this is similar to um, the kinds of, kinds of programs that you see in parks and rec departments in other cities. Um, one, area that I wanted to just ensure and wrote it in the staff report, you know, there's no desire or attempt to create uh, sponsorship programs or uh, put a bunch of signage or um, placards all throughout the town saying this person donated that, that is anathema to our community. We don't want to do that. Um, there's other ways that we think we can thank and recognize people who would make a donation. Um, it's also, it's also possible that people may not want to make specific donations in the way that we sort of suggested, but maybe there's general kinds of programs that they're interested in, trails, for instance. So we're eager to hear your thoughts on a program of this ilk. Um, if there is interest, we would certainly like to go out to the committees and gather their ideas. This has not been vetted with them just yet. We wanted to come to you first and see if they have anything that they'd like to add or see if this uh, could be a success in their eyes. Thank you. Questions? John. I don't actually have a question. I was going to make a comment, but uh, that's okay. I'll, I was just going to mention that uh, 
the first real push that I heard in this sort of direction was from the uh, Cultural Arts Committee. There have been a number of people in town who have approached Cultural Arts and said they would like to support the, especially the concert series. And I think we talked about it back several years ago and couldn't really come up with a good method to do it. So this is, I think this really has a, a place in, uh, in that context for sure. So I hope we can make that work out. I know the people on the conservation committee would be delighted to have that extra help. Okay. Sarah. I just, I think this is a great idea. I'm curious about the mechanics of how it comes together. So would it, would, would it be, you know, a person from town would have a passion project, you know, could be something on this list that they're interested in donating towards. They make the donation earmarking it for X, Y, and Z. And then the town, the execution of it falls on the town staff, I'm assuming. Yeah, um, so going backwards, the town staff would be responsible either directly doing the work or hiring contractors to do the work, depending on the type of work, um, uh, type of project. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, you know, we, we, we do think that it's important that the committees and the council identify a suite of projects that donations could be made to um, yeah. in lieu of a resident saying, I've got X amount of money for this very specific thing that's important to me. Um, we probably want to avoid some of that kind of thing, um, but uh, yes. That, that's kind of what I was going at. This reminds me a little bit of the um, foundation grant thing that we have in the school district. And I do think it's important that it, if there are projects that they're aligned with what there's consensus within the you know, town and the committees and um, you know, the volunteers that are already active would agree that their priorities. So the so then to clarify, there part of the process would be getting a list of um, potential projects to donate towards for people. Is that? Yeah. So on red page through the chair on red page forty seven, these are the right. types of projects you could do. Now we can certainly get either more specific or more general. Okay. Uh, a, a more general would be as I mentioned earlier, we could say trail improvements, and people could just say. If it's you know these five or six different things that make up a definition of trail improvements that they donate to that, or very specific projects, I think for instance, uh, you know there's projects that the conservation committee uh, really wants to work on. One was mentioned earlier, Harding Grass, for instance. We could have a Harding Grass removal program. People donate specifically to that. We get good people to come in and do that work. Um, this isn't intended to displace. Um, the, you know, the general fund dollars that go right. to support major programs. It's really intended to, to, to focus on really specific things um, that, are, that are amenities that people can see done fairly quickly and feel good about their contribution towards. So if this is intended to be kind of at least the initial list, my only comment would be like, for instance, emergency preparedness, that clearly can be a very broad range of things. So maybe that maybe that committee could help drill down on that one in particular. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Greg. Yeah, I, you know, my, my general inclination from, for, for these things, especially with these smaller projects um, where you, you, you might potentially be oversubscribed essentially, where, you know, you might have more donors than there are dollars that need to be spent. Um, is my, my, my general inclination would be to sort of have as little restriction as possible on the money as it comes in. Um, and yes, it may be earmarked for a particular project, but once that project's completed, if there's leftover money, it, it would be useful to be able to have the committees who are working on these projects or, or you know, whatever the, whatever the town, organization, a subgroup is that's directing the project um, to have the ability to kind of roll those over to whatever the next project is. Um, you know, f a lot of the time for these projects, they're big enough that you, you really need to have the dollars in hand before you start the project because you don't want to end up $50,000 short on a project. 
but if you collect fifty thousand dollars and then the contractor only bills you for forty seven, you've got an extra three grand that it would be nice to roll over to whatever the next project is that's kind of similar. And so it may not be exactly what you gave the money for, and I don't know how we can thread that needle. Um, and maybe Sarah, I don't know if this came up ever at the at the school foundation, something similar where people donate intending the money to be primarily for project. Like you have a fundraiser around a particular project that needs money, but then if there's leftover money, it's just in the general kitty for these types of projects. And so, you know, you can, you, you don't have to worry about going out and reaching, reaching back to people and giving them refunds on their donations. And then they have to figure out the tax implications of that and whatever other weird complications there'd be. Um, so I, 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 what I, what I would suggest is if we have, you know, a donation fund that all the money goes into and that is used to draw from for projects and maybe when you're, you're raising, you know, uh, you're soliciting people for donations, you're doing it around a particular project and you let them know how much that project is going to cost or whatever. Um, but that once the money is in the fund, it, it can be redirected if the committee or, whoever is directing the project feels it's appropriate to do that. Um, and I, I don't know what the right level of, because people do want to have con, you know, some say in what they're donating for, but at the same time, we don't want to make that be a big burden on whoever's actually executing the project. I think that makes sense. So correct, uh, fill in the blanks for me if I get this. The school, the school foundation, as I recall, kind of had a general, they, they solicited donations to kind of a general fund like you're suggesting. Then they had kind of every, every gala, they'd have like a fund the need, fund a need thing where you'd sort of, you could basically sort of like donate specifically to something until they'd reached it. So, so we could have something, we could organize it in that way so that if there was a specific project and we knew we needed $20,000 for it, we could just ask people to sort of, you know, donate something towards that. But then once it was filled, we'd say, well, anything else goes into back into the general fund for these things. And maybe, right. maybe we, rather than earmark things, maybe we just, we either pitch, either you donate to a specific task that we've, we've sort of identified and budgeted, or it just goes into the general fund for making it, you know, whatever, you know, whatever projects come up over time. Yeah. I think it's something like that. Um, you know, that there would be the, you know, the, who, the donor would have to assume if it's funded there, they give permission to roll over within that committee, let's say it's conservation or whatever it is. Um, but even on the, on the foundation um, endowment side, when we would give grants, like if, if that money wasn't spent, that you wouldn't roll it over. So that, it, it depends on which side of it, but bottom line is these are the kind of details that should be thought through around this. We don't need to do it kind yeah. of in this forum, but um, but it is helpful to define it out front. And I, th I would think for the committees, this would be a real nice, um, you know, source of, of income for important projects at the committee level. So it seems like it could be great. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit wary of, you know, 10 years from now having a budget showing 78 different accounts, all of which have $13 and 78 cents in them. <laughs> yeah. That there's no way, you know, no way to give the money back because which right. of the donors do you give it to? And right. There and should it's be just something. there forever. Yeah. There should be something money. written to avoid that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and one way through the chair, I mean, there's a, one way to do it is to keep it more general, right? There's, these are just the things that have, you know, if you donate to trails, it's going to be one of these six things. Mm -hmm. And that's a fund that probably never really extinguishes or never uh, resolves, right? You're always going to be doing projects in there. Um, another way to do it is if a committee had a very a targeted event, let's say the um, cultural arts wanted to do some fundraising around um, uh, the, 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 the concert series. Um, I mean, they could go out and they could hyper target people to, to donate to it. And once they hit their number, they're done. And so it's, it's over. I'm not worried yeah. about it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we can, I think we can work that out. And I think the committees will help tell us mm -hmm. through what they are looking for, what that structure could look like. Um, I, well, let me say for the record, I completely agree. We, 
do not need to be adding 84 new budget units um, to keep track of. That's that is not going to happen. <laughs> okay. Would um, so just through the chair, Ed, if it's okay with the the council, um, we'll spend some time doing some due diligence with the committees over the next period of time, and come back with a refined uh, proposal. Um, you saw that the formerly PV donates, that was our internal working name for this. Uh, so I just wanted for the record people to understand what that was. It wasn't some old program we had and we converted it into something new. Um, but that will, you know, we'll, we'll want to brand this and, and come up with something that, that connects with people. Um, but give us, a, give us a quarter or so to, to engage with the committees and see what they think and we'll come back. Is that okay? Sounds great. Yeah. Um, do any members of the public wish to comment on this item? I don't see any hands, Mayor. Okay. So you've got broad support and we look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, what's the next one? Now I've lost my place. Oh, number 12, the council liaison appointments for 2021. I tried very hard to <laughs> fulfill everyone's wishes. Um, I couldn't do it in every single case, but this is what I came up with. So if you would like to change something, this would be a good time to talk about it. Or if you've seen things I've left out or typos, that would be helpful as well. Craig. Uh, I think that there is a possible typo and maybe as a result of the confusion of what happened last year or two years ago when we first did it, the ad hoc wildfire preparedness, Jeff is listed as alt and I'm listed as the liaison, which is I think what we oh. originally did. And then in the first, first meeting of that committee when it was created, Jeff and I were confused about who was, who was liaison and who was alt and Jeff became the liaison uh, in practice, even if he wasn't technically the liaison on paper. So uh, I would suggest that we just make that official and have Jeff continue in that role uh, as the liaison and, and with me as the alt. I, I didn't even notice that I was listed as alt on there. So yeah, I, I'm fine with that. I, I, was, I was assuming that I would continue as liaison. Yeah. I'm gonna switch you guys, <laughs> right? Wildfire, Jeff is liaison and Craig is alt, correct? Correct. Everything else looks good to me though. Okay, anybody else have anything they need to point out? Okay, do we need a motion for this or anything? Jeremy? No, I don't think so. This is, no, I don't no. think I think this is your one power, Marianne, you get to to a point. Exactly. <laughs> we could do a motion if it felt more powerful. Yes, we could do that. It's more powerful not to do the motion and have me <laughs> do it. Okay. Um, oh, Council Liaison Committee and Regional Agency Reports. Who would like to go first? Jeff. Well, you got it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I don't think I have anything to report. Um, That's I will have a couple of, look what I, have, I, have. I know, I know. Um, I have a couple, I do have a couple of meetings coming up. I have parks and rec coming up and nature and science, but I, I have not had meetings. I just took over parks and rec and, uh, and nature and science has not been meeting for a while. So I actually haven't, I have not had many town meetings. What about um, PCE? Um, Actually, our board meeting is tomorrow night. Um, nothing particular, nothing, nothing pressing to report for PC. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what about John? Okay, I had a county emergency services council meeting for the first time in, I don't know, I think, I think I've been on that board for at least 10 years. For the first time ever, we had two people from Portola Valley attending. Really? Uh, they were, <clears throat> Dale Fowle was there, which makes sense. He's on the ES Emergency Preparedness Committee. And another 
resident was there asking about our our yeah our our, our numbers for uh, for the notification system um, the alert system real because we are such outliers in the whole list. <clears throat> yeah. Because they're so high. I'm sorry. Because our numbers are so high. Yeah, our numbers are so high. They're they're way beyond anybody else. Yeah. Which I think is probably true, but yeah, it, it, just to make sure, I made it put a call in to Jeff Norris, which uh, uh, has gone unanswered so far. But maybe eventually I'll find out what uh, if he had actually double checked. It, it turns out that some of the numbers on the list had been uh, accidentally double counted for Woodside and for a couple other other uh, communities. And uh, so I just wanted to make sure he actually checked ours too and made sure that there's one there were no double counting going on, but. I think we're probably good. Um, in other news, uh, the JPA has been, the uh, JPA that is the controlling body of the Emergency Services Council has been transferred from uh, the, the ESC to the county manager's office, um, which is <laughs> just a, more of an administrative change than anything else. Um, they just have to work out all the details of how that affects <clears throat> equipment and, and resources. Um, but that's uh, not uh, anything consequential. Um, the rest of the meeting was uh, regarding the CZ recovery, which is still going on, uh, especially now with all the heavy rains mm -hmm. uh, and uh, COVID response. Um, I guess that uh, San Mateo County had the first mass drive-through um, the vaccination site in the state, which is pretty cool. Um, and that's it for that meeting. Then I had the ASCC meeting, which was pretty much a, I believe, a repeat of the planning commission meeting to review uh, the wedge project. Uh, I, don't know if I, I think, Sarah, you were there, I believe. Right? And uh, it was um, pretty well attended, 62 people at one point uh, in the audience, and a fair amount of comments, uh, a lot that we've heard already, some, a few new, new comments. Um, and I think, it's, it, I think it's a great process, and I think it's really giving people a lot of opportunity to, to weigh in, which is, uh, as we've seen in the past, really necessary in this town, so I have to give everyone a chance to know what's going on. Uh, then I had the conservation committee meeting the next day and that one uh, potentially have two potential new members, including my daughter. Who well, might, you finally uh, got her to do it? I don't know yet. <laughs> they might, they, she might join if they can keep the, keep the length of the meetings down to a, a dull roar. You know, they get pretty pretty long. There's a lot going on in that meeting. <laughs> anyway, so she's uh, she's considering it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm seeing anything particularly outstanding of a lot of, a lot of this of uh, items covered, and they're finalizing their tree list for uh, removal of heritage trees reduce the size of madrones a little bit and um, try to try to make the, the whole list a little more user-friendly, simpler um, and self-explanatory. Let's see, I think <laughs> Okay, Craig. Um, yeah, John and I uh, had a marathon interview session for the Woodside Rhode Island's Maintenance District, which uh, we approved on our consent agenda. That was a um, fun time. <laughs> Thank you. It uh, went very smoothly, actually. We were ahead of schedule for pretty much every interviewee. It was, it was nice. It went very smoothly. How many, How many interviewees? 11. 11? 11. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, that's it for me. It's been Sarah. a slow half month. Sarah? 
Um, well, I'm not on any committees yet, so I've still just been doing um, attending meetings just as a learning process. I also had my um, training. I had my di uh, diversity training with, um, why am I thinking of, I can't think of the name of the group, but the second. Race, uh, race Forward. Race Forward. And I also have been doing the League of Cities um, newly elected training. It was two days right. last week and two days this week. It's yep. been okay. Um, what else? I have been, um, yeah, I went to ASCC and planning. I thought they were, I thought they were both really well run and I think they were super important in terms of communicating out to people you know, how many, how many opportunities there are gonna be in the process for people to give feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a lot of progress in terms of communicating that. And I hope, you know, people feel confident that they're all gonna have their opportunity through because of the way those meetings were run and all the future meetings plans. So um, I thought that was really good. <laughs> I attended sustainability trails and EPC meetings just for learning. And um, I met with a couple of the leaders from various groups, um, PV Ranch, um, PBNU. Uh, I had a nice hike with Mary Hofty all through, throughout town in the Wedge. Um, and I think, um, oh, Valley Presbyterian, the um, pastor there, Jenny Warren, had a really nice meeting with her, so. Great. And more League of Cities tomorrow and Friday. Ooh, fun. I'm excited. Yo, I know you are. Um, they're actually are way more fun in person because then you see people from all over the state. And everyone's very different from the Bay Area. I okay, I have seven reports and I'm not going to tell you a lot about the regional ones because I know you probably don't care. <clears throat> but I will start with CCAG. And there was a presentation by Heather Peter, <coughs> excuse me, Heather Peters from ABAG. Heather actually used to work in San Mateo County for housing. Do you remember her, Jeremy? No, okay. No, I don't remember. It's a very nice woman. So, uh, she was talking about the REAP, R-E-A-P grants that are coming for cities who are working on their um, housing units, so. Yeah, we applied for that one. There's three different ones, SB1, LEAP, and REAP, and we've applied for all three two of the three we've got that the REAP will get. Good. Yeah. So you already applied for REAP because it was due February 12th. Uh, yeah, I think it's already out. If it's not already out, it's it's on its way out, but we're applying. Okay. Right. And so the, okay, good. The minimum allocation is 20,000. I don't know what that max was. All right. And then spent an inordinate amount of time interviewing 12 candidates for positions on CMAC, which I don't even remember what the what it stands for. It's an acronym for one of the CCAG committees and it has to do maybe environmental quality and the legislative committee. And um, because every single person had to be interviewed and then there was this extremely tedious voting procedure, I think it took most of the meeting to do that. Um, and we did finally elect people. There was a ledge report um, from our lobbyist the ledge came back on Monday, January 11. There were some new chairs for some of the big committees. Um, for instance, the Senate Transportation Chair is now Senator Lita Gonzalez. It used to be Beal, Bell, excuse me. I always see his name, which is not pronounced the way it looks. Uh, Senate Budget Committee Chair is Nancy Skinner. And the budget came out and the focus is on the pandemic, vaccinations, economic recovery, schools reopening. Other focuses are homelessness, housing, wildfire response. And what was really interesting, and I'm sure you've heard this, there was a 54 billion deficit projected, but there's been a massive swing. And now it looks like we will have a $22 billion reserve. So that's good news. Transportation um, revenues were not as bad as they thought um, and they're trending in the right direction. That is not true in our county. So I found that odd. 
let's see what else. Um, a lot, a lot of the bills are being reintroduced. Um, the housing bills, a lot of bills are focused on pandemic response. Transportation's pretty light and we're waiting for the climate resiliency, but I think that is just came. Seems like we talked about that at the flood and sea level rise meeting. It's all a blur to me. Then they talked about the Measure M strategic plan. And then the big news of the night, although I already knew, is that Sandy Wong, who has been working there for, I believe, it's either 14 or 17 years, um, announced that she's going to be stepping down. She's going to be retiring, 17 years. And that is a big deal. So they have already formed a search committee and I'm going to be on the search committee. Sandy has committed to staying until they get a new ED. So that means that in transportation in the county, Jim Hartnett, who's the CEO of, you know, Transportation Authority, uh, Sam Trans, all of it, Caltrain is leaving in April and Sandy will probably leave in June. Okay, then I had a, speaking of transportation, a CCAG Express Lanes JPA meeting. And we discussed the MTC means-based toll discount pilot and regional consistency with the BATA fast track policies. As I said, I don't think I'm going to get into this with you, but um, there's a lot of information. On January 20, we had a CK Resource Management Climate Protection meeting. Uh, and we talked about a, um, there is a Presidio Graduate School-led single family home electrification systems mapping project going on, discussed that. And then there was also um, discussion of the draft criteria for the selection of the 10 homes for the electrification case studies. Uh, maybe the most interesting was a presentation on water agency urban water management plans and alternative water supply projects that are currently in planning with the SFPC. And this was from Tom Francis from Bosca. Um, just essentially everybody has to do, it used to be just the big water agencies, but now it's pretty much everybody has to do this um, urban water management plan um, that, that tells your story about water in your district. And he explained every single piece of it, what they have to do. And he said that these have to be publicly available. So for instance, our district is Calwater Bear Gulch. They, when they're done with this, this has to be on their website and it should have an awful lot of information that would be of interest to residents. And then there was a presentation on the value of resiliency to support critical loads and communities on on-site microgrids with Craig Lewis of Clean Coalition. And he used as one case study, a uh, school district in Santa Barbara, which is in a very high fire danger area, such as our community um, and what, how they were using microgrids to plan for um, the wildfire danger, which I think was one of the reasons that we were thinking of a microgrid for resiliency in the case of an emergency. So this is, there's more and more um, evidence that that is a great idea. Okay, what else? Did, oh, I watched the State of Transportation 2021 program. Every year the district does a state of transportation. And I wanted to watch it this time because I know they've been hit so hard from COVID. Uh, it was the, it's the worst crisis in history of public transit, not just here. F here in 2009, they'd been making progress. They had a growing ridership on Sam Trans. They were, they were um, growing their Caltrain system. They'd adopted a service vision plan for Caltrain. And then 316, governor issued the stay at home order. So everything just went straight down. Caltrain had a 95% drop in ridership. Sam Trans a 70% drop 
you know, there was confusion about how the virus is transmitted. So they had to do this whole protocol and all the um, buses. Um, what they found out from all of this is the people who really, really depend on tra um, transit, really, really depend on transit. And it doesn't matter. They have got to ride those buses to get to work. So out of that, they um, learned a lot about um, equity it, and what they need to be thinking of in the coming projects. Um, the only reason that they're afloat is because of the CARES Act money that they got. And our R's passed, but they have not for Caltrain. That was the measure we passed in the fall. We have not, we will not see that money for a while. Okay, those, that was the main thing. And then I had a flood and sea level rise district meeting on the 25th. See, uh, there was a lot of discussion about state Senate bill 45, um, which is there, there wasn't a resilience bond for 2020. So SB 45 was introduced by four senators and it is like this session's resilience bond. Um, two thirds of each house of the legislature have to pass it. And if, if they do, then it will go on the November 22 ballot. So they were asking us to um, endorse it and write a letter and we did. There will be $5.5 billion, um, 2.2 billion to wildfire prevention, um, a whole bunch more, oh, wildfire, wildfire prevention, drought and climate change impacts, you know, close to a, what is that? A billion for the coastal lands, a bunch for fish and wildlife and a bunch for climate resilience. Um, if, when it goes on the ballot, it would need 51% of the voters. And what else did we do? There was one, um, Don Horsley brought up one sort of interesting point. He said, if we put this measure on the same ballot that we put a measure for the flood district, isn't that gonna be a bad idea? Yeah, that would be a bad idea. So we would not want those on the same ballot because we are going to have to do that to fund this agency. Okay, then there was a, um, there was a presentation by BC, oh, here we go with the acronyms, BCDC, that's Bay Conservation, what is it, Jeremy? Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Okay. It's their Bay Adapt Regional Strategy for a Rising Bay. So basically it's a lot of principles that they're trying to develop that would you know, be applied to, to everything. Um, in the region to protect against sea level rise. So we discussed that. Let's see if there was anything else. I think that's about it. Okay. I think we talked about subcommittees. I think I got shoved onto a subcommittee. Yes, I did, I did. Okay, planning commission was on January 20th. And as um, John said, the Planning Commission and the ASCC were somewhat duplicative, um, not completely. The Planning Commission, two members are recused. Nicholas is recused because I think his firm works with Stanford. And um, Ann Koff Sill was recused because she lives within a certain amount uh, distance from the project. So three planning commissioners will be making the decision on the Stanford project, but they are pretty strong. And based on the meeting that I watched, I think they're gonna do just fine. Um, most of the um, issues were around the fire, the fire danger, trails, a lot of curiosity about affordable housing, you know, how, what is it, how are they chosen? A lot of commentary about Oh, here you've got you know these little tiny affordable housing units, and here you've got these big houses. Um, big, a lot of people participated. Everybody got to speak. Everybody was heard. Um, it was a really good meeting, and I listened to 
part of the ASCC meeting because I was coming from the flood and sea level rise and they handled them differently, but both of the chairs were extremely um, generous with the public, I would say. And I think that's the way to go. Okay, sustainability committee met on the 25th. They are um, down to not that many members. I can't remember how many, but not many. So we, they will be recruiting. Uh, let's see. Brandy brought us up to speed on the Cal Water Smart Meter project, which is just ridiculous bureaucracy. Uh, we, she talked about how green waste is no longer going to recycle our styrofoam because they don't have a market. Um, it's expensive to recycle styrofoam. So um, Brandy ha did talk with the woman at Ladera who recently did the recycle <laughs> drive and was buried in styrofoam. I mean, they had to rent a truck to take it to whatever place actually does recycle it into this gooey substance. So there's some thought maybe next year we can work with them and help fund it. I don't know. But for now, our residents are going to have to figure this out themselves. I know there is a place I go to in, I can't remember if it's Sunnyvale, but you can take it. You have to put it in 30 gallon clear bags. And they say it costs $10. You have to pay $10 per bag to give it to them. But when I went, it was $5 per bag. So it costs money and you have to drive down, but they do recycle it. It doesn't go to landfill. Let's see what else. Oh, and she talked about our, what I call the big dump days from Green Waste. We're gonna have one the last weekend of April um, and then another early August and then another early October, and she's also trying to do a household hazardous waste um, pickup at one of them. And then they talked about subcommittees. And what was really impressive, and I think Brandy alluded to this, Stefan and Walt worked on this incredible matrix where it's all about battery backup, everything from buying a, a little battery to your whole house, you know, outfitted with solar and battery backup. Um, and I, I, I really hope that we will be able to get that printed and out to the community because it's really interesting. And then Brandy talked about the climate action plan and see if there's anything else. And their priorities, they're meeting monthly now. And they're going to go to a model like all the other committees where the members are the chair and vice chair and not a council member and a staff member, which I support. Okay. I think we're going to move now on to Jeremy's town manager report. Thank you very much. Uh, just a few items. Um, uh, Brandy alluded to a conversation today that um, staff had with uh, the chair of the Parks and Rec Committee. We're thinking about what's going to happen when uh, the um, county moves into uh, different tiers for COVID and uh, the impact that that will have on our field use. We um, are uh, looking to prioritize youth field use first and then wrap around adult field use second, and then uh, what we're calling one-offs. Because um, other fields were totally closed, we were getting calls from folks who wanted to do various interesting one-off events. Um, so we'll see if that continues in that vein, but um, it looks like uh, John Myers and David Bailey will be a subcommittee of, of, the, of the Parks and Rec uh, Committee to help um, very quickly if we're getting requests from the various leagues to uh, to prioritize them and schedule for them. Uh, our audit, um, annual audit, uh, we're starting to send documents to Mays this week. Um, so hopefully in about a month or so, we'll be going back to the finance committee with the results of that audit. Uh, this weekend was the first weekend that uh, the leaf blower, gas powered leaf blower ban was in effect. Um, 
got a few uh, complaints from folks. Um, as I think I said at the last meeting, you know, really we anticipate doing a ton of education um, at the start. We updated the PV Connect tool um, to reflect um, um, uh, the way that the staff will be interacting with residents and the information we're looking for. We're unable to respond to general um, um, complaints if people don't know exactly where it is, there's not much we can do about that. Um, so we're looking for specific addresses and we have a letter that we'll send to residents um, that will um, alert them to the, to, the, to the ban about the program uh, that we have um, um, to trade in. And obviously there were um, additions to that program tonight from uh, uh, John's uh, colleague's memo. Um, so there'll be more to put out to the residents. Um, I am anticipating hearing back from uh, Senator Becker, Assemblyman Berman and Supervisor Horsley's office on coming to uh, upcoming council meeting. That could be as early as the meeting on the 12th of February. Um, so looking forward to that. And then there were a couple things that I'd like to share, um, screen share. Um, the first is in the mayor's um, most recent message. You may have seen uh, this uh, Know Your Zone flyer. This was actually put together by our friends at, um, at SERP. Uh, there's gonna be much more to this, but this was our first um, um, outreach on the Know Your Zone, Zone Haven tool. So we were excited to have that go out. The, uh, excuse me, only two things today. The second is, uh, this is an updated map from Howard on the various fire mitigation work that we've been doing. I'm sorry, it's a little small. I'm gonna zoom in on some areas just so you can see the extent of the work in town. Everywhere there, there's a little green dot, we've done some work. Um, this is pretty extraordinary. Um, and every time I get an updated map, I'm gonna bring it forward um, and uh, you know, reflecting on what some of the committee members said last night. I mean, this is such a change in how the community is looking at, at these issues. Uh, these are not uh, programs that could have possibly been done a few years ago. Um, and now there's broad support for ladder fuel reduction, uh, shaded fuel breaks and, and the like. Um, I had a nice conversation today with uh, Chief Lindner over at the Woodside Fire Protection District and um, said to him that I fully expected in the upcoming uh, draft budget to continue with a pretty sizable expenditure to support this kind of programming, including uh, tree removal, which is a big part of the next stage of the Wildfire Preparedness Committee's work. So, um, and he was excited to hear that. They've got a really good crew um, and um, we're really just delighted with the work, but as you can see, this is uh, this is pretty extraordinary. I mean, it's every part of town has been touched at this point, um, except for some of the communities in here. With that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the digest from January 14. Item number six. I will attend that meeting and vote. Anything? All right, let's move on to the digest for January 21st. Nope. All right, then we will adjourn this meeting and go into a closed session. Thank you to the members of the public. All right. Hi, Jeremy. Oh, let me get rid of my city of San Carlos stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on just a second, everybody. I'm doing a few things here.